Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding here on the number one value investing podcast in the world, 800 miles away from Mr. Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are joining us, welcome. Thank you so much for stopping by. Be sure to check out all of our content on the internet. If you're listening to us on Spotify or the podcast app, hit that subscribe button. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Leave us a comment. Thumbs the video up. I mean, if you thumbs the video down, well, YouTube removed the ratio, so it doesn't hurt my feelings anymore. So thumbs us down if you want to. But thumbs us up. Check out all of our content. Go to FocusCompound.com to get access to investment write-ups uh, by Mr. Jeff. And if you like free content going all the way back to 2005, hey, guess what? I got something good for you. You can go to Focus Compounding, hit the free content section, and you could read content going all the way back to when Jeff was like, what, 19, 20 years old? A young Jeff, ambitious, excited, loving investing, writing about it. So if you want to go through that timeline, go to FocusCompounding.com. We got it for you for free. All you got to do is click that free content section and go all the way back, which is a lot of fun. And I myself go back often and reread a lot of his old posts. So in today's podcast, Jeff, we're going to talk about mm -hmm. durability versus moat, how that okay. ties into the investing process. And then we're actually going to look at some companies as well and how we, um, you know, really work it in. You know, moat, is it, do you think moat's a bit of a buzzword, Jeff? Because yes. I think you're much more technical about moat than other people. And I think you're much more technical about durability than other people, right? Um, I mean, how do you typically think other investors, just from speaking to them and emailing back and forth with investors over the years, how do they typically think about moat? Like I think about, it's just a buzzword. And then, you know, they're like, oh, does it have great margins? Is the industry maybe a little bit more settled? But I feel like they really don't get down in the nitty gritty of what moat really means. What do you think? Yeah, because Buffett talks about it uh, needing a moat, I think that every uh, value investor, their write up, that sort of thing, is going to um, include some discussion of moat of why they would uh, the company would continue to earn high returns on capital. But that's really the only way that they think about it as, right? Like, I feel like, and maybe it's just the nature of the content I'm reading online, which is on Valley Investors Club, or maybe it's a mm -hmm. pitch deck or something like that. They'll be like, yeah, this has high return on invested capital or high returns on equity. So it must have a moat. Right. Whereas that's not true. Obviously, you would have a high return on on uh, capital for a period of time. In fact, that's the worst sign is a very high return on capital. That's recent because it's going to attract people to compete with you. Uh, higher, the higher the return on capital, the more likely you're going to have competition. So uh, companies can briefly have high returns on capital. Um, if they didn't have high returns on capital, then they'd be more likely to not face competition. Uh, so, and also companies might have a moat without having high returns on capital to start with. So that almost all the internet things that we talk about with some exceptions like eBay, um, didn't really bring in a lot of revenue right away, but they still had a moat. Lots of early broadcasting things had a moat before they were profitable. Mm -hmm. Do you think this simplicity comes from the fact that Warren Buffett kind of talks about it in such general terms that other people can understand. I mean, he really simplifies this whole process. So I sometimes wonder if that almost does a disservice because coming across a business that actually has a moat, I feel like is so far and few between. Um, do you think that is a reason that a lot of people sort of miss if a business actually has a moat or not? Um, I think they've, there's kind of two kinds of value investing the approach that Buffett has and the Graham approach. And I think value investors know that no matter what they're supposed to explain why there is a moat. Um, and so they include that in it. I just think that it's automatic that way. Uh, it, not all value investors do, you know, um, if you read the blog Clark street value, for instance, I don't think that blog is going to tell you that this business has a moat. It's a special situation. There's, uh, the business is worth this amount compared to these other peers, that sort of thing. Uh, and us, a lot of the investing that Buffett did early on, it doesn't involve moats. He doesn't talk about moats when he's talking about investing in 
uh, if you look at his partnership letters, there isn't discussion of those things. Uh, so, and, and a moat is not necessary in situations where the, uh, it's cheap enough, especially cheap enough on like gram type basis. So working capital, um, average earnings, uh, buying in the right part of the cycle, all those sorts of, uh, things, uh, the moat really becomes important if you're paying above, uh, and on, if you're paying high price to book, if you're buying on the basis of earnings, future cash flows, discount, discounted cash flow uh, stuff, that all depends heavily on on moat. And the reason for that is really because if you're trying to predict the future, and the future is uncertain, you want some level of predictability, right? I mean, do you think right. Buffett doesn't talk about moat really in the early days as well because of he never thought about it? Or was it because of the type of investing he was doing? And then as he transitioned and got larger to where he had to focus on different situations or where he did focus on different situations. And then, you know, Munger, quote unquote, as you know, Buffett liked to say, um, you know, really pushed him in that direction, which Munger says is a bit exaggerated. I mean, do you think he didn't speak about mode a lot just because of the type of investing he was doing or because he actually like didn't think about it, right? So if you're doing a special situation or you're buying a stock below its net tangible assets or net current assets, you don't really care about the actual business itself. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's true. A few uh, situations that he got involved with probably taught him a lot. Uh, probably American Express, Disney, Dempster Mill, uh, the um, department store uh, and sees candies, I think are the big ones in that way. So uh, with with uh, Dempster, uh, it was a uh, working capital bargain, but it turned out that a lot of the product lines were no good, that they didn't move. Um, and so a big part of it was streamlining it. He didn't do this. He brought someone in to do this for him. Uh, streamlining the business and raising the prices on the things on which they were sole supplier by a lot. Um, so it, it probably was a combination of realizing that an asset bargain uh, sort of business, uh, sort of investment uh, worked out for reasons that had to do with the, the product economics of it, right? American Express, he had this idea that it was a attractive growth stock uh, because of its brand name. And uh, then when you have uh, the, the one that's very obvious is the experiences not that far apart in time and under the um, sort of as they're moving to the different holding company type structures that they're using at this point, the department store and sees candies. Uh, the department store had the right kind of management that they liked. It was the right price and it had the right past performance. Uh, and it didn't work out very well. In, in particular, like use of CapEx didn't work out that well. They, in fact, didn't expand as much as the company probably would have wanted them to, uh, certainly as a lot of the employees wanted. And C's Candies worked out much better than expected. And when he talks about standing on your tiptoes on a parade, uh, I think he's talking as much about the department store experience as uh, Berkshire, actually. Although everyone talks about Berkshire Hathaway, the textile mills, um, he knew that was a bad business when he bought it. I think he didn't realize how big the difference was between department stores and Seuss Candies. So he knew Seuss Candies was a better business, um, but I don't think he realized how what the geometric advantages over time are of a business that's so good that way and what a business that's purely competitive with retail is. He had really bad experiences in retail and also some bad experiences in insurance, which are very competitive and can teach you about moat. Um, with both retail and insurance, a big issue is that it's hard to develop a moat and that it's an operator-based uh, advantage. So if you lose your operator, then, then you don't uh, often you're not able to sustain high returns on capital. Whereas the, you don't need much structurally other than a better operator to succeed in retail or in insurance. And he had that experience in insurance while he was running things and brought someone else in. Um, Berkshire had very bad experiences trying to expand out of national indemnity into other things. And then with uh, retail, they had bought a couple of retail businesses and one of them was uh, Associated Con Shops, which was very successful. And then 
uh, once it lost its founding management, uh, was not successful and they had to get uh, out of it. And we're talking about something that went from very high returns uh, from like 20% plus returns on equity um, in a tough business to something that wasn't worth much of anything anymore. And the insurance experiences were the same. National Indemnity, they bought it, it was successful. Uh, once he got a G. Jane, they could have a successful business that they could build out. In between that time, most everything they tried to do was not successful. So there's this experience like with the department stores, they had management that they liked and everything, it still didn't work out. Why didn't it work out? Because retail, insurance, industries like that, uh, it's very hard to have a moat. So you're basically saying on the insurance side, it's like the operator is the moat, right? So is that a business that even has a moat? I mean, you could look le- at hedge funds, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Like does, what's focused compounding's moat? Is it that Jeff Gannon is the portfolio manager? I mean, is it the same way to right. think about that with insurance? Yeah, so there's no moat. I mean, insurance banking, there can be moats that can develop over time. But I think that in retail insurance banking, um, these are things, there's some other industries too, where uh, operational uh, behaviors are most important. So you can you can have a business that has, um, you can start a business, you can start a bank, for instance, there aren't a lot of banks starting in the last 15 years or so in the US, but you could start a bank, they have some start in the 2000s, that uh, is more successful than the biggest banks in the country on a return on cap, you know, return on equity basis, which is what matters. You'll ha- end up with a higher price to book and um, you'll create more value over time than the biggest um, companies. Uh, Buffett gave a lecture where he talked about the difference between CBS and Cap Cities and how CBS had all the advantages in the world. Cap Cities had none. Cap Cities far outperformed CBS. Well, that's because the, the moat is not a national moat. The moat is local in each place. And Cap Cities could build that up in a bunch of different places and have better operations in every way than CBS did. Um, so there are businesses where the operations and who's running them and the strategies they use are much more important than anything else. And you can in retail and in um, insurance and in banking uh, have better results than other people just because you run things better. There's no doubt about that. And you can do that for a time. Uh, sometimes most develop out of that. And sometimes you just have a better way from day one. Um, you know, direct auto insurance and there are some other direct forms of insurance had a better way of doing it and that developed a moat and didn't need operational advantages that way. And uh, the same thing can be true for certain other kinds of businesses where they could develop a moat over time. Um, it's, it's when you're dealing mostly in very specialty type things, it's possible. But in more general things, it's hard to see how you could have a moat uh, in something like retail, for instance. Um, there's some advantages to scale, but then there are disadvantages to scale. There'd be a lot of issues. And if you look at returns on capital incrementally over time, I don't see a lot of evidence for, for moat, for instance. So when you say disadvantages to scale, what do you mean by that? Well, so there's a few dis- disadvantages. Um, one disadvantage to scale is that usually the, the ratio of your frontline um, employees to employees who are internally focused gets out of whack as you scale up. So that is a fairly large disadvantage that scale has. So in other words, the, um, the volume, if you think about it like a shape, is growing faster than the, the perimeter that's enclosing it. And so you have this problem that you're going to end up with more and more people who interface only with other employees inside the company instead of with customers. That's a huge disadvantage of scale and that tends to happen at most companies as they scale up. Um, the biggest advantage is that like an entrepreneur starting up a single location has is they're actually working with customers. Um, in fact, they're working with all parts of the business. As it scales up, they get insulated from all of that and there are some disadvantages. There can be some advantages um, because you have kind of greater specialization between people. So the other disadvantages is that you can have are obviously you can't specialize as much. So specialization doesn't work as well. You become generalized. Um, you also have more of a market impact. So for instance, Target and Walmart having too much in terms of inventory of things 
are going to hurt themselves because they own too much of the inventory and relative to how much of the inventory gets churned in the United States in a given um, period. And so they can't just onload uh, so much of one product, whereas um, some companies obviously can do that. Um, and so you just, you know, it's the same thing as you'd have in any industry that way, where you have a bigger market impact that way. Um, there's some advantage to that because sometimes you can uh, shape your industry in a way that benefits you. That's, you know, strategy in terms of moat over time is to try to develop the industry in a way that benefits you the most. And that is something that you can do if you have more market power. And sometimes you can do that in a way to help you. One of the advantages of scale that will almost always be the case, although again, there's some disadvantages, is that you're going to have, uh, if there's, if your industry is at all politically sensitive, you're going to have more power than your competitors, new entrants, things like that. And you're going to be involved in shaping the regulatory climate, the political attitudes, the relationships uh, that you have with um, any sort of interest groups, much more so. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in like the Altria example. Yeah, tobacco. Right. They have a lot of influence over exactly how certain things are, are dealt with. And that's an advantage in some ways, because anything's going to be created in a way shaped to benefit you for those issues on which you care a great deal about it and other people do not. Now, that doesn't mean that regulations are going to be written and enforced in a way to benefit you if there's other people who have a lot of interest in it that care about it. Uh, so if you care a lot, if um, you know, if you're, if farmers have a lot of votes in some places and you're doing something that's going to uh, be less of a benefit to them, then obviously that still means that you're going to have uh, a lot of pushback on that. But on other things, it's always going to be the case that some topics, they don't, uh, there won't be much political interest one way or the other about what happens. And so you can help to shape things. And so something like Altria has certainly done that in the example, uh, or for a while was able to do that, that they actually had a problem recently with it, but um, was able to do that in making certain, uh, in terms of how certain categories were treated that were outside of cigarettes and things like that. And, and that is something because they're a hundred times bigger, more than a hundred times bigger than their closest competitors in other categories. And so they're able to exert a lot of control over that in terms of regulation. Uh, so they just have a lot of more lobbying power and all of that big tech things have a ton of lobbying power. And so obviously smaller ones, let's say you had some smaller tech thing that had a totally different business model than the big tech ones. They suffer from that because obviously the, the landscape is going to be written in such a way that isn't going to, uh, allow for those sorts of business models. So you try to shift the industry so that it more reflects the prototype that you've built. So someone can't come along and build a prototype for another business, a different business model that's as successful, more successful than the one you brought along, you know? And some of that is, uh, does happen politically and stuff like that. Cause that's the easiest way to cut off a business model from being a possibility. If you're a bunch of cab drivers, you try to stop it being allowed that there is an Uber or Lyft or something and try to do that early. And that's your opportunity to, to um, have a business model the way that you want it to stay. And that's an advantage to a huge scale or collusion. They both you know, work the same way, but in a lot of places it's hard to collude as compared to having to scale yourself. Yeah, it's very hard. I mean, you look at and you read these books about Uber, for example, and the regulation that they had to overcome um, uh, you know, <laughs> on multiple fronts, both from like the taxi perspective and then also, I think they had like something with, if, are they contractors or are they employees? Um, and then you could look at like what Airbnb had to go through. I think they also still go through today with regulation of renting out your rooms and your house and that for hotels and stuff like that. It's a huge regulation barrier. Right. And that's one thing that large scale helps with. I, when I read write-ups and things, it seems like people always say that having more scale is helpful. And, you know, this isn't a podcast about scale. But scale is helpful only in terms of scale of a specific function, a specific activity. 
So if you're producing a huge amount of one particular part or something, yes, scale is, very, is a huge advantage. Um, there are still some disadvantages to scale. Like I said, you have the, the market effect problem that your impact on the market is going to be very large if you're the one producing so much of that thing. But um, performing a bunch of different functions across a uh, wide geographic range, it, it's not going to work the same way. So it, you could say, oh, who's the biggest airline, uh, right? So they would have these advantages of scale. But Southwest operates fewer, uh, operates more of the same exact plane. So is that the function that matters as much? Some fly more out of the same airport. Is that the function that matters as much? Scale usually is going to be at a much lower level that it's an advantage than at these huge levels. Um, but, you know, there's not much of an advantage to being one of the biggest uh, food retailers in the United States versus being the biggest in just Florida, just Texas, just uh, New England, whatever. Uh, because a lot of the functions that you're going to perform are localized that way. And so they're not going to be big advantages. For instance, uh, what does it benefit me to advertise in other places? It doesn't. So it doesn't work. However, scale on a national basis is hugely an advantage for the brands that are in the stores. It's a very big advantage to be able to use uh, media nationally and have people talking to each other and everyone recognizes Oreo. They don't just recognize in one part of the country and have no idea what it is in another part of the country. So those sorts of advantages are national, but a lot of other advantages are very local, so it doesn't matter. Uh, mostly, I think people on the scale thing and the moat do tend to equate it with size and size over the entire size of the business rather than size relative to each other in certain markets, certain functions that they're performing, competition for certain kinds of customers, whatever. Um, and that's backed up by the numbers usually because for most of these companies, their highest returns on capital were much earlier in their days when they weren't very national and weren't one of the largest in the industry. Greenwald, in his book, Competition Demystified, he actually goes over that, how sure Walmart has had amazing returns over time. But if you actually look back to their earlier days when there were purely local advantages before going national, their returns were actually better, um, like returns on capital and stuff like that. Yeah. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. One, you could have worse operators later on. You know, that, that's a major mm -hmm. factor. When we look at the history of Disney, you have varying returns on capital at times because you have very huge differences in terms of the quality of the management running it. You have some of the best running at times, you have some of the worst running at times. So that affects things too. Um, most companies obviously are going to be biased to have their highest returns early on. That is when their founder is running them because they became a great company because they had a great person running them who knew what they were doing with that. And they're able to do that for a certain period of time. Um, you're much more likely to have an excellent um, management team uh, as a company that becomes big in the earliest part of your history be because it's a, a, it's a necessity that that's how you became a big company. If you hadn't had a very good management team from the start, you wouldn't have become very big. So you'll you have that kind of thing happen. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that even a big deal though? Right. So say Walmart's returns have gone down over time, certainly since mm -hmm. its first, you know, early days or whatever. I mean, does that matter though? I mean, if you were a public investor even at its IPO, or let's say you invested before, do you even care that their returns have gone down over time? I mean, I guess you'd be like, Yeah, their returns could have been better, but I mean, you've still made I mean, what, hundreds of multiples on your money? Is that sure. a bit of a paradox? That's true. Although for the last probably 27 years, you haven't beaten the market. I think that's roughly right. We looked it up a, a few uh, pop podcasts ago. Um, whereas there are other companies where that's not as true. Uh, you know, I would have to check, but like um, until very recently, if you looked at returns by decade in terms of return on capital and stuff for major national cereal companies, they were fairly similar from, from uh, decade to decade. Margins are fairly similar. Turns are fairly similar. Once you were one of the biggest companies in that space, uh, your results were pretty similar over a long period of time. They didn't radically slow down. Uh, the way that when we talk about Southwest, Walmart, uh, th those face issues that the things that they're doing become worse and worse as they go into other areas. They, they could be things that offset it. There could be other advantages to scale that offset it, improvements in their operations that offset it. But strategically, what they're doing is moving into um, less and less fertile hunting grounds throughout their history for decades now. The first few decades were the, the most low-hanging fruit. What are your thoughts on, as a source of research, 
let's say you're going to study an airline or you're thinking about investing in a bank or you think about investing in an insurance company or a core processor or a product or a cereal brand. I mean, what are your thoughts on actually going through the process to test the source of a moat to see how hard it would be to start one up yourself as if you were going to start your own business to compete against the company you are underwriting? Do you think that could be a good research process to really understand moat and the industry and the competitive advantages that the company may potentially possess? Yes, I do. I think it's hard for people to see sometimes though. I'll give you two examples of things I think have more of a moat than people think. Doesn't mean they'll have great returns on capital because they have certain issues with bargaining with other companies, but I think they're much harder to replicate than people think. So uh, one is um, underwear, what they call innerwear, something like Hanes Brands in the United States. Um, this is socks and underwear and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it's much harder to duplicate that business. Uh, Berkshire owns Free the Loom. You have Haynes Brands, which is a public company. It's much more difficult to, to duplicate than people think because generally retailers, no matter how concentrated they get, even if your main retailers are Target uh, and Walmart, you're also supplying the U.S. government and because the army needs things and uh, and and um, certain other uh, customers like that. You are generally doing this not on a contracted basis. So they're not outsourcing production of that stuff and then providing under their own name. And they're not agreeing to buy a certain amount. For instance, maybe they miscalculated Walmart buys too much, Target buys too much, whatever. Um, as a result, to be able to manage the business properly, you need to have actually a very large amount of um, working capital. Uh, of specific working capital that you have to have a large amount of inventory uh, without knowing that you're going to be able to get the customer to sell things for you. Uh, you don't want to produce that inventory on, on, on spec, on speculation. So you don't want to find a place in Dominican Republic or wherever to produce all this for you and then not know if you can sell, um, you know, for, for instance, these companies might sell a billion pairs of socks. Um, you know, so one customer might be buying 100 million, 200 million. So we're talking about several million pairs a week that they're buying. Um, the scale that we're talking about in terms of each of the functions of what's going to happen is difficult to with you've got that chicken and egg problem. That if you don't have the customer, then you won't want to produce all this. This would be avoided if the customer was willing to produce this stuff on their own. But then you even have a problem that these companies are much bigger than any one of their customers. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, um, the other one is, so something like private label. So private label is interesting. Um, in some categories, it's not that bad to be private label probably. So the one that I think has a bigger moat than people realize is private label uh, beverage in the United States. So it's assumed that someplace like Walmart or Target can, uh, since they're selling Sam's Cola or selling whatever juice thing or um basically have a lot of power in that relationship. I'm not sure that they do. The reason why is you need a lot of scale in North America to produce these things. And, and this is the bigger issue, the industry developed in such a way that the biggest producers of these things are parts of systems of branded companies. So the problem that you run into is there's not a lot of independence. We, we've talked about this with like um, podcasting, for instance. Like um, people will say, well, should uh, Amazon or Apple or Google or, or whoever buy some of these podcast hosting companies? It's an issue because if they do, then they're not independent. So if you do that, and even if it's successful, probably what happens is something else comes up in its place to replace it because they need something in the ecosystem that's an independent. So there aren't, it's because you know that Coke and Pepsi systems are not going to bottle for you. So someone else has to do it. It has to be done somewhat locally. You can't do it in Asia and ship it over. So you only have certain amounts of plants of a large enough system to work for you. And it, you don't want it so that you just have the private label in California. You're going to want it across the country. You don't have a lot of choices. You're very limited in terms of your choices at that point. And that comes from the, the issue of the independence there, right? That you don't have a lot of choices that way. And like a lot of the others I mentioned, it also has the, the matching up of a large customer with a large supplier. That's one of the issues about scale is one problem you run into with the economies of scale and the diseconomies of scale 
there can be diseconomies of scale in that usually you you limit yourself out of a lot of options for supply. This is a very big problem that companies run into. So for instance, Walmart and Target, if they want to actually have supply across their stores, can only deal with a very small number of companies. Um, uh, large beer companies, large, um, you know, large beer bottlers, large um, uh, soda, things like that, have a very limited number of, um, of uh, suppliers that they could possibly have for producing the actual bottle. So like when we talk about Ball and, and um, companies like that, there there's just a huge limitation because you can't use smaller suppliers because they can't provide as much as you need. You can't be a hundred times the size of a supplier and have a relationship where they're taking much of any of the risk. So you run into that problem as well. You're not as nimble as you get to that size. Yeah, and distribution is very important as well, right? We're going to talk about this a little bit more uh, a few slides away, but you think about beverage companies, for example, if they already have their main products or their most profitable products in, in Target or Walmart or whatever, that's a huge distribution advantage for them for any new product that they bring in-house or acquire to roll out in you know, Target or Walmart. I mean, you've used the example of John Wiley, for example, with universities and how they have a huge advantage to basically roll out all of their branded stuff um, through their already established relationships and from like a distribution standpoint. Yeah, one way to think about Moat is if to think about a, syst a systemic advantage that you have uh, across your whole organization is whether you can plug something into your system and it's worth more than another's. That's such a great way to say it. Yeah, so for instance, DreamWorks Animation mentioned uh, that if they had made their movies under, under Disney, uh, they would. They thought they would make about twenty five percent more on consumer products, because when they licensed it out to different companies, uh, um, they were never able to replicate the system that Disney has in place through their stores, through their um, uh, many other relationships they have to be able to sell as much consumer products. So the same movie, if it made the same box office for DreamWorks Animation, was going to be less valuable than it would be if it was part of Disney. Uh, and so part of what they did is they worked to improve that over time, but then they get bought by someone else and, and they try to do that. Uh, so that's distribution is usually, uh, it's usually where the advantage is. I mean, if you're going to have a really lasting mode of lasting distribution advantage. Now, nowadays people are scared of distribution advantages. Uh, they talk about middlemen and all that because that's the kind of thing that can be disintermediated by the internet. Uh, however, like for instance, movie studios, right? Since the early on in the uh, sound coming into movies in the US, only a few years after that to today, they are basically, they've merged some of them together, but the largest, it was like five majors and three minors or something in the early days of like say the 40s or something to today. They're basically the same exact companies. They're the same studios. They've been cobbled together in different ways, but they're the same. Almost no one, uh, the one exception basically is Disney, um, all, which, which was not a distributor. Uh, almost no one else has completely fallen away to nothing. There, there are a few that declined a bit and got bought. Uh, and there has, there's, might be some shifting among with the market share, but the market share is still much the same in that the top uh, few in a couple of tiers own all of this. Um, it's not because of production. That, that's not where the advantage is. It's not because of financing. It's because of distribution. There's a huge advantage. A movie will make much more money if distributed by a major studio. And, that, and so that will make you so much more money that they have a permanent advantage in that respect. Now, it's not a very big advantage against each other, and it may not result in particularly high returns on capital. Just because you have a moat, doesn't mean you're going to have a good business. And just because you have a good business doesn't mean you, you have a moat. It's a question of the durability. Buffett's point is you can see the moat, you can see the quality of the business, anyone can see that. That's not hard. I can see it's earning 50% return on equity right now. The question is whether that will last, right? Um, so we could go back to the 1940s and think about what other industries had major players that were, you know, what about the top 10, how many of them survived to today, in what form and all of that. Um, but the advantage is distribution in that industry because it you will make a lot more money for the same 
input that you have if you have distribution all around. And people don't believe that. When there have been write-ups of things, um, they never talk about the, the fact that the distribution is such a big advantage and the distribution of having the availability in the US and around the world of being able to distribute the same product and make more money from it. But taking the same thing and making more money off of it because of how you sell it is a really, really big advantage because it's not going to cost you any more to do it. If you wanted to have a completely speculative independent production of something or you wanted it to be um, bought in advance by a studio that can distribute it, it's basically going to cost the same thing. So if it can make a lot more money because uh, of the way that it's distributed, then you're, then you're going to have a big uh, advantage that is durable. Because the, the issue is why you don't need a very big advantage, but why would you ever say you had a great product? Why would you ever not use someone who has distribution advantages? Today, let's say you're not going to go through the old um, Hollywood movie studios, right? Okay. So your choices are limited, though. You might say, okay, well, I'll, Google can do this for me on YouTube. They can distribute it for me. Okay. Uh, Amazon can distribute it for me. Apple can distribute it for me. Netflix can distribute it. Um, and then you have the studios that own the streamers. But it's not really all that different. You're not going to say, th there's this idea like, oh, you'll create a great product or something, and then you'll keep it for yourself and create something out of it by putting it somewhere, and then that will develop into a distribution advantage over time. You know, That's not really what's going to happen. Logically, on some basis, depending on your bargaining power with them, anyone who wants to create content will put it in places like that because it works better in terms of how it's distributed. And those advantages in distribution might be really small, but they often are ones that get you to have a preference that you're preferred over any other choice. Why not? You know, why not is often a better question to ask than, than uh, why. Like, why would someone use our company? Isn't always the best way to figure out moat. A lot of times, the best way to figure out moat is why not? Is there any reason why someone would not use us? Do you think distribution advantages are harder to quantify? Because in like 10Ks and annual reports, I mean, often they don't just come out and say, hey, we have this huge distribution advantage that we're able to take advantage of and our competitors don't have this, or maybe they do, but it's, you know, pretty much ingrained in our industry. I mean, why do you think people don't talk about distribution advantages more? I mean, you had said that you don't read too many write-ups where they hit on that. Mm -hmm. Is it because it's just harder to put on paper or learn about? You have to do more research that's outside of the 10K? I think one, people don't agree with me that it's as important. For instance, uh, when I looked at video game companies, I figured distribution was very important um, and that they were most similar to things like movie studios and most similar to things like drug companies. I consider drug companies to be mainly, that wasn't how they started, but the major drug companies, major pharmaceutical companies that are diversified are distribution. You know, they buy things, they might acquire uh, some biotech thing or whatever to get the rights to something. But the existence of patents that they had on stuff in the beginning allowed them to create the distribution system that's able to sell things um, and the relationships that they entered in. Same with movie studios and stuff. It may be luck of why they, that happened in the first place. Same with uh, cereal companies. They had one brand that was a success. And yes, it was the product. That's how in the early days they succeeded. And that's what an entrepreneur would focus on. You got to have the right product. You know, you got to fill this need that people have there. You got to be riding this wave of whatever change there is. Yeah, that's all true. And all these companies did that in the very earliest days, got lucky, and then they had distribution advantages after that. And so the same thing in their system is worth more. Um, but they tell you how big their sales force is in a lot of 10Ks. Mm -hmm. They often tell you how many people are involved in sales, how many people are involved in R&D, how many. In, um, you can compare their sales force versus the sales force of other companies. Uh, it, they often tell you, they almost always tell you exactly how the product's marketed, if it's marketed directly in person, um, whether they use independent brokers. Um, they do s tend to focus a little bit more in their 10Ks on the things that investors focus on, which would be technological advantages, patents, yeah. um, things like that, process advantages, which I don't think are usually very important. I mean, I think they're important for a company to keep having them. They're just necessary in terms of your operational, that's what you do in the industry. 
that you get a brief advantage from something because you keep innovating on whatever. But I don't believe that. You know, I, I wouldn't want to buy a company that's based on having advantages of patents as opposed to having a, a superior sales force. Really? Why is that? Well, a few things. One, the, the, a big problem with patents is the substitution issue. All that really matters is that the product provides whatever benefit it, it needs to to the people, a perceived benefit to the people who are using it. Um, it doesn't really matter how they do it. So you can reverse engineer things to get to the same effect. One, because, for instance, it's been proven in the, in the market that it works, right? So um, th that there is demand for it, right? So basically some company comes out with some way of doing an erectile dysfunction drug, and then they realize, oh, there's a lot of demand for this product. Other people can figure out how to, uh, how to, how to sell it, right? Sure. And that seems obvious, right? But actually that might not have been known at the time. How well would they be allowed to market it? Would they really be allowed to market it a lot to people who are a lot younger than the audience that they claim is who they were selling it to? Without that, it's not a blockbuster drug. But with that, it proves that it is, right? Then how many different ways are there to, to provide the same benefit? A lot of times, um, you can work around patents on things. And I think that the issue is more whether it's proven in the uh, marketplace that there is sufficient demand for it. So I would avoid that. I also think that in terms of the long term, you're going to have bigger advantages in terms of the organization. So, and I think this is hard to evaluate, just like the Salesforce thing. We can see how big the Salesforce is, how much they're spending on it. I don't know we can know how good it is, but we can try to figure it out. Patents, I don't think are necessarily that important, but R&D is. So you'd say, well, but R&D is what gets you the patent. So wh why are you saying that? Um, but it's the ability to generate on a continual basis. You know, something like a patent is not going to be valuable for very long. It's going to be valuable for a number of years. And some other people come up with different ways of, of um, replicating the same thing. And you have a high risk of substitution if that's all you're relying on is the patent. Um, for instance, if you have a patent on something and you're charging a really high price on it, as an example, um, that really encourages someone to try to come up with a way of substituting it. However, if you have Coca-Cola and you're selling at a very reasonable price, um, there, you can't actually come up with a product that you, we can be sure is a substitute for Coca-Cola. See, the problem with drugs, for instance, is that they can do studies and doctors can tell you this is actually a substitute for that and you can believe it. If it's something that ha there's no substitute for WD-40. There's no substitute for Tabasco sauce. There's no substitute for bitters that you put in a cocktail. There's no substitute for Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper. So really it's a brand thing. Well, brand, but actually, literally, the customer doesn't know what the product is that is being substituted. What does it mean to be Coke? The other things are colas, but your demand isn't, I need a cola, right? So the only advantage for like on a lot of patent things for drugs and those sorts of things is that the problem is that they might be way too technically similar. And that always worries me. If we can put specs of them next to each other, I don't think that's a very good durable advantage that you can have. However, if you have certain benefits, certain beliefs that this drug is going to be more successful than that one, you know, that's a different story. Also, you just start, you're going to get a head start and have an advantage. So taking the example of drugs, as it comes off patent, you're still going to have a higher market share than other companies had. And that you would have if you all came to market at the same time, even if there's no preference for your drug, just because you're able to prescribe more of it earlier on and you'll keep more of the market share and you'll have that advantage in later periods. So if you're able to get an advantage early on by using a patent or something, then you could have a lot of uh, success. The most obvious examples are if you get a patent on telephone or radio, uh, telegram, something like that, and then you have enough time to be able to build up a network advantage, but then it's the network thing. It's not the, the patent that did it. It's just buys you some time right and that's why when we talk about a lot of these companies these um internet companies that maybe don't have patents on things that don't have advantages that way but know that they're chasing a network thing um they pursue all out growth because they need to get to a certain point at which they use whatever advantage they had early on which can't be maintained to maintain a relative advantage later yeah that, that was gonna be my question right maybe the patent allows the mind share to grow so whether that's through a product or a network they are able to go wide uh but by the time the patent's actually up and people could come in with substitutes maybe just the brand is there or the mind share is there to where that business can continue to 
have some sort of advantages, right? Maybe it was like a first mover advantage or efficiencies because of scale. Right. It's the same as if there was a government monopoly and then they uh, opened up competition. The monopoly has an advantage because it's being able to do all this. It may have some real disadvantages too, though, that inherits, but it, it will have those advantages as being an incumbent there. Uh, when they deregulated airlines, deregulated um, telecom things, uh, you know, the ones that were already in place do have an advantage to a certain degree. They have certain things locked in. Um, so they may have an advantage over things being started up from scratch. And you would have that same advantage, you know. And it doesn't really matter if it's done by a government thing or luck or whatever. Uh, you know, the example I was given is like um, local bus service. It always ends up in a monopoly, whether a government grants a monopoly, whether it operates a bus service for itself in a city, or whether you allow on the road competition where there's briefly a period where there's a bunch of different competing routes uh, run by different companies against each other and they're coming into a bus stop every couple of minutes and they're uh, totally different companies. No matter what, there will come a point where um, there'll only be one because if there were a bunch of them, they would all be run on profitably and that can't last forever. They'd all mm -hmm. be running a loss against each other. So it's going to come down to one eventually because that network thing that we talked about, those advantages, you know, that tends to lead to a winner take all thing. And that's what we hear a lot about with Moat today. I think it's all tied up with the internet companies and network effects, a lot of those kinds of things, which I don't know. I think they're complicated. I think it's a maybe a lot different than people think um, with some of them about how big the advantages are and um, whether it's necessary to, um, we talked about Uber and Lyft, for instance. There's a concept with network things. If you think of networks as like exchanges, there's a concept which would be minimum uh, liquidity. So it isn't really necessary, though it could be, that an exchange provide the absolute best execution, for instance, or that it have all the trades on it or whatever, as an individual, uh, to, to me as an individual. If we're all just individuals using the service occasionally and stuff, we don't really care if uh, London provides a slightly better um, price or a uh, faster trade or something than New York. Now, giant institutions do care. And if everything's funneled through them, that will lead to one outcome. But if it's a bunch of individuals trading once a month or something, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is a minimum viable level of liquidity. So if something is too illiquid, it won't get any of our business. But if it's liquid enough, it won't really matter to us. If we get to the point where the, the spreads are a penny on a stock or a tenth of a penny on a stock in, an, in another place, if it was all just made up of individual people trading, both exchanges could probably exist, right? It's important because what are, like say Uber and Lyft, what are they? Is it just minimum level of liquidity, meaning a minimum level of scale in my local community that matters, right? So it's useless to me at some point, but at another point it's more useful, but being twice the size, does it matter? If you're twice the size, five times the size, whatever, if uh, you achieve that minimum level in, in my area, right? So in certain areas, it, it would just be that it's useless. I don't, you know, it, it will never work. Uh, but for others, it might be that any of two, three, four different providers would all be seen equally by the customer. There might be advantages on the other side that you could argue for. And a lot of the things that I hear about, like Uber and Lyft and certain other companies, are basically ideas about advantages that you would have at a certain point with enough scale if your business model slightly changed and if you got to a certain, you know, um, whereas for instance, on food delivery, it's very different. You can easily see on food delivery, the big advantages on the uh, restaurant side, not the customer side from huge scale and increased bargaining power and ability to actually make it profitable. Uh, so those just look like a very different business. And yet sometimes the same company owns those two businesses they're often compared to each other, but I just think that they're probably different um, in terms of the advantages that scale would have on the bargaining power on the other side. Do you ever think through whether the business model even makes sense? I mean, to your point about food delivery, I mean, does that business model, is that even a viable business model long term if you don't have unlimited access to capital? I mean, you even think about how much the restaurants have to pay right. the food delivery. It's like, it doesn't even make sense, it sounds like. So these are really difficult, really, really difficult, because you hit on something that is the one of the most difficult concepts around. They've demonstrated that there's demand for the product, right? But there's demand for lots of products we, that companies don't provide because it's not profitable to provide them. 
um, there, there'd be demand for, you know, uh, having the, uh, a supersonic jet from New York to London leaving every hour for $100 uh, a ticket, right? Yeah. You'd lose a lot of money on it, but there'd be demand for it, I'm sure. Um, so the issue, of course, is that if you have a lot of people using it, um, you can always change the product economics a little bit later on to a way that makes sense to make you money. That's always the pitch, right? Right. So a lot of these are proof of concept things um, that eventually will get to a level where it will make sense. And the question is whether it scales up or not. A good example of, um, of these sorts of things is um, arguments with uh, green energy, solar and wind, but uh, you know, um, because they've had a reduction in their costs over time as they produce more of it. However, if you look at it, it's unlikely that much of this has been due to any technological advantages or advantages due to just producing a lot more of it. There would be some advantages, and you know, if governments wanted to bring down the cost of something, they should pay to produce a lot of it at first to jumpstart the industry, and then later others will do it. You know, if you want, if you for some reason want your country to have a lot of gene sequencing stuff in it, you should pay for a lot of it up front. It'll bring down the cost dramatically the same way it brings down costs of computing power or something like that. But an issue is how much of it is the cost of resources that you have, the cost of capital that you had, and those are different under different scenarios. A lot of times it's not clear what it's going to develop into and how they're going to figure it out. It's a lot of trial and error. Uh, Amazon's a huge success and I think failed in most of the idea that people thought it was going to be able to do. I don't think that uh, the idea that they the everything store idea worked. Um, I think that they make money on advertising, they make money by being a platform for other parties to sell through them, uh, a marketplace. And uh, they made money on the things they always did, the, the media and um, books. That wasn't, I mean, at some point, that wasn't actually the, the pitch. After the dot-com bust and everything in the early 2000s, it was going to be they're going to sell everything on Amazon themselves. We're going to buy it. It's going to replace a lot of other things. And that's what's going to be the success. I don't think that really happened. But they used having a huge customer base and a lot of loyalty and a lot of positive experience about it to go into certain other things that they were able to make a lot of money off of. So it's like a reflexivity thing. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of things develop out of other things that way that you then realize, okay, we can sell this or that to it. I mean, we started by talking about American Express. American Express ended up in totally different business than what they started in, but they built on the same advantages that they have, the intangible advantages of customers. I mean, I've said before, and you know, like Phil Fisher would disagree with this, but when looking at a company, I would probably care more about their customers than their employees. A large base of happy customers is, you know, all, you know, all companies say our biggest asset is our, our workforce. But I don't know if that's true. I think your biggest asset might be your happy customers, your, your web of um, trust in the industry that you're in, the relationships that you have, the way in which you interface with your suppliers, your customers, what their attitudes are about you, how much they like supplying and buying from you, uh, how likely you are to be the first call for things. That, how automatic that relationship is, that's the thing that actually lasts for a long time. And I don't know that Costco's workforce is more important than Costco's loyal customers. So the customer behavior. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of reasons. But, you know, um, one, of them, one of them is just mercenary, which is that, you know, people are being paid to work. Um, to a certain extent, customers are, you know, let's use a movie example, right? Because I've been talking a lot about movie things. Uh, Star Wars. Is the advantage the people who work on Star Wars or is it the people, the people who make it or is it the people who love it? It's fans. The, the thing you're monetizing is fans of it who are much more loyal than anyone who's involved in making it. The people who make it, you know, some of them love it. Some of them don't love it. it you know, they're being paid a lot to do it. Um, you can put in other people to make it. it. That's not what it is. There's actually more loyalty, more non-financial loyalty from it coming from your customers. That's most obvious in something like movies, but it actually is true in a lot of different industries. That actually your your customer's relationship with you could be, it may, maybe this isn't as true in, in certain industries, but in a lot of industries, it could be a, a stronger relationship than you actually have with your employees because so much of your relationship with your employees is quantifiable in terms of financial benefit and uh, being able to be compared to other things. Whereas 
you have this overwhelming importance in your employee's life, relatively um, small importance to the customer who could make a decision about something um, on the basis of other factors that you have. So I think a loyal customer base, a loyal base of, it's not just customers, it's different, all sorts of different entities in the, the ecosystem that you're working in. That's really important. And those relationships often are going to be more durable. Um, so, you know, when we take the insurance companies, for instance, uh, they say their biggest asset is their employees, which it may be, but, you know, their biggest asset might be the agents who are distributed. The agents actually shows you that way. You know, when we talk about Hunter Douglas, is it more important who's in the plants making things or is it more important who's selling your product who are independent dealers? Um, although in some cases, they're dealers who decide to sell only Hunter Douglas, but they're, they're the ones who sell it. And that relationship could be a bigger advantage that you have over others. And that relationship is a big part of the durability. You don't see a lot of like moat in situations where there's huge turnover in distribution and how something is distributed. Um, that would be pretty scary if it's distributed one way this year, it's distributed a different way the next year, you know, if there's um, the channel that is distributed through the way in which it's distributed is very important. When you have these cult like fans, so you could take Star Wars in your example, mm -hmm. or we've used the example of Games Workshop a lot yeah. on this podcast. I mean, do they have competition? I mean, yes, in the sense of you could use and focus your attention on other games or other products, but there's only one Games Workshop. And right. they've built up such a huge fan base over number of years. Same thing with your case in Star Wars. Right. I, I mean, do they have competition? Right. I, they don't have an exact substitute. There's no way they have an exact substitute. And that's a better way to word it. Yeah. That's right. A, way to word it. a lot of it is because the customers put in the time to invest themselves a lot of time into something. Um, that's also that's also a thing where that can be an advantage. It can be good in terms of um, the economics of it. It can be good if you can find things in which there's a certain level of investment needed that is not um, uh, money. So if the biggest investment by the customer is time or something else in the relationship, um, trust that they need to get over some level that they need to whatever, um, then it's hard to uh, take a customer away from them on the basis of just price, right? So the, the issue in like the drug examples that I give are that the problem that some drug things have are you're exactly quantifying what the benefit is that you're getting from it. The price can be quite high and quite noticeable in the way that it's done. Um, and so if there's situations in which there's a benefit of a trade-off, but uh, a trade-off between them that you think you're getting mostly the same benefit, even if it's, even though it's somewhat inferior in some cases um, and it's your health. So you think you care more about that. That's actually more likely than someone's going to um, switch to playing a totally different miniatures uh, thing instead of a, a, a Games Workshop instead of Warhammer, or um, think that they're going to replace Star Wars as the franchise that they care the most about and all of that. Now, there's a question of how much you can monetize it. The problem that something like Star Wars has versus a drug company is a drug company can gouge you on that as much as they want to. It's much harder for Star Wars to, uh, for Disney doing that, to extract as much value from the customer as the customer's uh, perceived benefit. So generally, there's a huge leakage in terms of a very big benefit to the customer that the company can't monetize. You can do try to do that. You put it in all your theme parks, you sell all these consumer products, you put a TV things and this and that, and you try to monetize in a bunch of different ways. And then you put ads around the things that you do that. And, and there's ways that you can do it. But the problem is that there's probably millions of people who really like it and, they, and Disney gets $10 off of each of them. And it's worth a lot more than $10 to them. Whereas uh, with, with a need, you know, you are able to do that with, with things like uh, the drug example. The drug example is closer to like shortage of a commodity in which the customer is going to pay whatever in that uh, situation where there's shortage, you can extract the full value from them. In fact, you can over extract sometimes that way. Um, that's much harder to do with certain other things. You have a lot of the benefit still retained by the customer which isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. In fact, in the long run, it might be a benefit somewhat to that. Games Workshop is a complicated example because the benefit probably hasn't changed that much over time, but the company's figured out ways to keep more of the value for itself. And uh, so basically to have more monetization at the same level of benefit to the customer.
right? And when we talk about all these things where we talk about these like new concepts um, that have been losing money for 10 years or whatever, the big thing is how do we monetize it? We know that there's a benefit to the customer, how do we monetize it? Some are fairly easy, but I do want to warn people that I feel like so much of the stuff that's called big tech is actually advertiser supported media, which was a proven concept for how you monetize audiences and has been for a very long time. So any business which idea is now Twitter hasn't been a huge success on this, but any business which idea is at some point when we get a big enough audience, we'll sell ads. We'll figure it out then. It has a much better, uh, clearer way of making money that's very proven as opposed to something else, which has a completely different way of saying, here's how we'll monetize it. And so you get in some other cases, stranger, you know, we have Robinhood, right? Payment for order flow. Um, we have thing, and you know, mm -hmm. with the other broker things, you have things that are loans that we're going to do that are, you know, this and all sorts of different, um, ways of monetizing. Cause when you do free, you have to come up with a different way of how do we monetize free? Yeah, sure. Free definitely works really well. It, it works great for going viral and all of that stuff because it puts no, um, it doesn't stop the spread of it at all. It eliminates all friction, but like Google, the entire business is, is making money off of ads, you know? Gmail exists because it's it's taking your information and using it to advertise to you. That's the whole basis on which it works. And if that was, while it might seem, are people going to, when you say is a free email thing going to work, is a, is a search engine going to work, is um, a video site going to work, all those sorts of things to me, I might not know, but is monetizing it through having, people are going to habitually have their eyeballs on this for X amount of time each day and just not even think about the fact just like they didn't think about the fact i'm in front of the tv watching cbs and this is happening um that same way is this a viable business it's a very viable business and if it's explained from that side of it you go of course yeah that can of course you can make a lot of money off of that it's harder when we talk about the food delivery things the um the ubers and the lyft because then we do get into issues of well exactly how much can you charge for what how segmented because it has to be very segmented in terms of how you can make that money you're going to have certain trips that are going to make money, other trips that aren't going to make money, because you have to know how much can I make off of someone the same way you do with a, a different kind of flyer on an airline, someone who books at a different point in time for this exact thing. We have to figure out different ways to get money off of that. That's much harder than let's let the advertisers will figure it out. We just create a platform that allows, here's the audience, and then we try to make it as useful as possible to the advertisers. And we don't even have to really figure anything else out. They'll just bid against themselves to the point that we, you know, they come up with a business model for us. Sure. I mean, that's kind of how podcasting is, right? Yeah. And uh, large podcasts are able to, to make money, right? Yeah. If they can get a relationship with advertising. Actually, the big problem with podcasting, as you know, is, um, which is why like YouTube, for instance, if we put our stuff up on YouTube versus doing it yourself, um, where people are inserting ads themselves or host read ads into audio podcast things, why is YouTube get so much money off of that kind of thing? It's just because it's providing the access to the advertising in a very simple way where the advertiser doesn't even have to worry about doing anything. It's all automated by that. They're not actually choosing you. You don't really have to do anything. And then they take this gigantic cut. And on top of them taking a gigantic cut, the effectiveness of the advertising is actually probably less than if it was a host right ad in the middle yeah. of an audio thing. Yeah. But that inertia that, okay, the, the, the media outlet didn't have to do anything to sell it. The advertiser didn't have to do anything to find it and to have them married up is what made it such uh so so they're able to basically get you a lower price in general their cost per thousand is going to be lower doing it that way um and they take a bigger commission on it and yet that's the business model that works really well whereas if it was actually being able to do the search and finding and matching up better than that you get higher pricing and you could do it with lower commissions too mm -hmm. um but you can see you know that, and that that is a huge scale advantage, but that that's a distribution scale advantage thing. But that's absolutely true. Scale advantages can be tremendous that way when it's a uh, search advantage. We talked about that, like um, with with stores and, and, and as an example, um, what's the place that's a one stop shop? That kind of scale advantage is a huge advantage. That's the thing that I was talking about with supermarkets that. It's harder to replace supermarket a trip to an actual supermarket than people think because you don't realize how bizarre. Uh, how bizarrely varied your basket is. 
it's a very strange basket that would be very hard to reproduce online when you really look at what you bought and what and you you realize oh i went to the supermarket and i was able to do all that in that basket if you were just going to the supermarket and saying i'm going to buy x number of pounds of meat and uh and i'm going to buy uh you know whatever it is you know these five items that that you spend a lot on um that's very easy to duplicate but the one-stop shop thing is very hard to duplicate it's even been hard to duplicate with online things it's very hard for them to to um replace that so that's the kind of weird thing with like moat sometimes having the one-stop shop is a huge advantage in terms of scale and its breadth of the offering right um that is very uh a very common advantage that you have is the ability to have greater breadth than other um, outlets you know it's the same thing with when we talk about search things or uh, youtube things or whatever if you were convinced that what you were searching or that what was up there was the whole world of available things you're you're pretty biased to doing that if you realize that you search for something and it's not on this platform you know say there's apple Podcasts and there's some other things and you search some other thing and it's not on it that greatly harms the possibility that you're going to use them instead you know you have a big advantage from something that you know has everything a store that you go into and you're like they will have every option of this that i think of that has a bigger advantage than you might think but again that's like a distribution thing because it's the the um the breadth of the offering you know like uh, it, you wouldn't have the same advantage if you just offered a uh, had a huge amount of sales or something but you had a limited selection it's having a large selection in one place i use brave browser and mm -hmm. when you download the browser the default search engine is their own version and yeah. i used it for like 20 minutes because Not when good. i would go to ask god google a question there would just mm -hmm. be one or two pages that would come up and i'd be like oh right. my gosh you know so i immediately switched it to google because right. when anything comes to my mind and I Google it, you know, you want the options to sift through all those things. Right. And that's a really good example because it's mostly a confidence thing. It's not really, of course, you don't need a million uh, hits of the different things that you can find that way. Yeah. But you now know that sometimes the thing, this, the actual search thing that you want is not going to be in there. And so even if Brave did it at an 83%, probability that they're going to achieve that and Google did it in 96 you're going to default to going to Google that way because you're unsure about it that way you're just not as confident they definitely will have it it's funny too Jeff because I mean when I just Google things in general I mean I probably don't go to like the second or the third or the fourth page that often I just read you know maybe the first right. page of links and then I'm off to wherever that rabbit hole takes me very interesting. So durability and moat. Uh, durability is about the product and the product economics of the industry. Uh, moat is about the ability of the specific company to sell more of the product and have better product economics than its competitors. So put simply, uh, durability is about the relationship between the customers and the firm we are looking at. And moat is about limiting rivalry between firms. That's a very good... Um uh just definition of it separation nice. of those two things hey I because, take any compliment i could get from you i'll take uh because a lot of times i think that the the there's business risk you know is um that people talk about with a the company they kind of don't look at both of those sides so they say oh it's totally dominant in this okay but is this industry going to stick around and everything but the other one they do is nothing could be more durable than this food thing or whatever okay but if it's a, a fad that way Mm -hmm. you know um it may have no durability at all as a company you know which is why we start with durability on our own investing process yeah. right because yeah. if it's not a durable business there's no point in learning about the moat the value the capital allocation the management everything else that's the first thing on our list that we look right. at so some examples of how we'd classify durability you could do and i color coded these if you're watching uh green uh zero risk to durability nothing about the product is going to change in the next 15 years some risk to durability something about the product may change in the next five to 15 years uh, and then of course big risk to durability something that we try to stay away from uh, something about the product may change in the next five years and you really want to categorize these and know what you're going into right because i mean yes we want to stay away from big risk to durability but who knows right maybe it's a situation where it's trading below its net current assets right you want to know mm -hmm. what the situation is uh when you go into it and jeff talked a little bit about this 
at uh, at the beginning of the podcast, but you know, this is where Buffett starts as well, right? This is a direct quote from him. Filter number one, can we understand the business? What will it look like in 10 to 20 years? So when Buffett says, can we understand the business? That's what he's really talking about is, do I feel certain it's going to exist in 10 to 20 years, right? Like when he says, oh, we don't understand tech. I'm sure he can right. understand what a lot of these technology companies do, but he's basically saying he doesn't feel confident if it's going to be around in 10 to 20 years. And he used the example, take Intel versus chewing gum or toilet paper. We invest within our circle of competence. Jacob's Pharmacy created Coke in 1886. Coke has increased per capita consumption every year. It has been in existence. It's because there's no taste memory with soda. You don't get sick of it. It's just as good the fifth time of the day as it was the first time of the day. So basically he's saying though, is that he feels confident Coca-Cola is going to be around, you know, 50 years from now, uh, along with chewing gum and toilet paper. He doesn't know if Intel will. Right. And what's really interesting about that is that is a, um, if you think about it, it's more of a habit-based thing that's somewhat arbitrary. Um, what benefit does chewing gum provide? I, I don't even know if people have figured out what exactly the benefit is. Why are, why do people use it? Um, uh, toilet paper. Well, there's different ways in different societies that do that differently. There have been. Um, there's yeah, there's different day, methods. Right? Yeah, exactly. Isn't America like the only one of the few that doesn't do that? <laughs> you travel um, overseas and you're like, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, cola, it's, uh, it, it's its own category. I mean, it's really this strange thing, you know? Um, whereas Intel, it's very clear about what exactly it's providing. So I think that's fascinating because when you have something that's it's just not likely that um, 130 years later or whatever, um, something that people have been doing a certain way for that long is going to change because there's something very fundamental about it that we may not even understand. So I just think that there's certain behaviors that people have. The examples we talk about all the time are like, um, that I talk about all the time are things like food and, and entertainment. Uh, many of them are not real needs. Um, they're not the cheapest uh, thing for that, and uh, that they may not be as basic as shelter and clothing and stuff, but they don't change all that much, really. Um, you know, they, they change in certain ways, but there we can see a habit. We can see through actual experience, not through reasoning, how people have used this and how little it changed for such a long time that we can understand it. In you know, if you saw some trend that suggested that breakfast things were changing in terms of how people were doing things with breakfast. Uh, or you saw some trend about how people are using toilet paper differently, whatever. Um, I don't think you would believe that it's going to drastically change the economics of a cereal business or, or a toilet paper or whatever, um, just because of your understanding of human nature that way, right? But when we were talking about graph tech, if someone comes out with a report that says something differently about how um, their customers are going to be um, using things in terms of how they design uh, uh, production methods or whatever, what technique they use. And it's not going to need this input or it is going to need this input. Uh, that's much harder to figure out whether that's true or not. You know, let's say you own some lithium thing and, or some battery company or whatever, and it, some electric car companies are, are, um, exploring doing this a somewhat different way that uses less of this product and more of the, less of this commodity and more of this one, a different technique that would be cheaper under this method, uh, or these conditions, if the price of this is so high. You know, that's going to be a lot more questioning whether that is uh, going to continue to be the case. So a lot of it is through actually looking at, which is what Buffett does, is through looking at actual human behavior over a long period of time where we have a lot of information. Um, I've said before, Buffett, he's definitely a high confidence investor, more so than anything else. So although he talks about the probabilities, um, he talks about cases in which we have huge amounts of evidence. Um, that is unlikely to be the result of like data mining type stuff of, of incorrect associations of things and puts a lot more weight on that, on the historical empirical sort of thing that we have over a very long period of time than he does um, on more uh, economic theory type things that other people would use. Most of the things that I see in write-ups uh, rely a bit more on, on that, on, on economic theory and trying to say that how close is this model this thought experiment to the actual reality that we have here applying the theory to that um instead of saying look this thing's been around for 130 years there's probably some reason why people uh do it that way mm -hmm. the part that worries me jeff 
is I do believe a lot of investors, myself included, right? I'm also in this bucket, but I try to be aware of it, can be a little bit too overconfident with these things. I mean, is Starbucks going to be around in 20 years? Probably in some capacity, right? I mean, drinking Starbucks and going to Starbucks is such a habit for a lot of people. But I mean, what did people do before Starbucks? I mean, habits change over time. And that's the part that worries me. I mean, think how much technology has changed over time. I mean, sure, over a 20 year time frame, um, that's a very long time. You can be like, oh, you know, computers are going to exist 20 years from now. And they probably will in some fashion. But think about the first computer that came out. And now think about the cell phone that everybody has, like probably a foot tops away from them as they listen to this. Uh, that's, you know, faster, better, more efficient, cheaper than the mm-hmm. very first computer that came out. So I don't know, like sometimes I worry right. about that feeling overconfident on what's going to exist 10, 15 years in the future. Right. I agree with you to some extent. But maybe it doesn't there, matter over 50. Like, I don't know, like maybe investments will change over 50 years. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're not, we don't need to be like, oh, we're going to invest today and this business needs to be around in 20 right. years from now or 50 years from now. Right. The other difference, though, the, the, a really key thing, and this one's hard to understand, is there to a certain extent, you don't, um, okay, from a business evolution perspective, you don't want to be overly fit for the environment that you're in, meaning that you're so specialized that when something changes, uh, you'll be extinct. Yeah. So um, a great deal of flexibility in terms of inside the organization, production methods, um, the actual product that you're outputting, things like that actually will result in a much um, uh, m- much longer uh, lifespan. I-, I mentioned movie things. Movies have changed dramatically. Uh, in, in the early days, um, they were competing with radio. Then you have competition with TV, which changes it. But then you still have things that are different from what uh, people could, um, uh, because uh, y- y- then you could show things that you couldn't have on broadcasting. So you still had some distinction there. And then you have, um, uh, for the first time ever, you have things that are actual video, and then you'd have later have DVDs and things, which is that you don't have to have it. Uh, uh, there, it has an aftermarket for it. Dramatic changes, huge changes in terms of the declines in um, cultural importance. So my guess is, if we take the very peak years of the war in 1940s to today on a per capita basis, I think uh, we've had close to a 90 percent decline in. Um, the importance of movies in terms of uh, number of titles seen by uh, each individual person. Um, that was a freak period, right? Because you had uh, rationing for the war and all that. So it's like now with COVID, where coming out of it, we have a freak period for travel and all that. People are spending less on goods because they and it's all going to experiences. Back then, they had the reverse thing, which was you couldn't get goods during the war. You couldn't buy a refrigerator. You couldn't buy a car. You know, um, and so all you could do is you that no one was unemployed so everyone was making money and then all that they could do was to spend it on on things that weren't rationed um but how big is the change really well huge changes in terms of internal to the organization right but then in terms of the things that we've talked about um on the outside the changes aren't very big and you know coke is a good example of that where you know in the there's a book about Coke. It's told in a couple of books about Coke. I think Buffett's told the story too. Um, one CEO of Coke is talking to a former CEO basically and saying, you know, we're going to change the formula or whatever, you know. And um, the other one saying, you know, we're always changing the formula. You know, that, that they've, there's always been changes for a variety of reasons, including supply things and stuff early on, but they always experimented with that and always uh, were changes over time. But no one notices the changes that are happening. It seems like it's the same product. We, a lot of times the product is not the same much later than it was in an earlier period. But there's the flexibility to be able to meet those demands. So once you had a few automakers become dominant in the United States, you got those same automakers for the entire period. Everything about it changed. Everything about the product changed. But it doesn't matter because it's very easy for each of them to put in and, and, and uh, those aren't the kinds of changes that matter a lot. Where we talk about distribution, those are changes that matter dramatically. Um, also, there are instances like um, 
you know, take Budweiser or something or Kraft. Um, those are companies that have lost some market share over time, but very little with huge changes in um, the, the way that the, the, the spread of how the, the product uh, fragmentation is, right? They've been able to maintain a lot of it because of inertia. Um, so that's a very big difference um, with, with some other products about whether the company can meet the changes over time. Uh, the one that won't, so true technology companies, I, I don't know how to make this distinction exactly. The, the technology companies we have right today are media companies. There's some that aren't, some are business services companies or something, but they're media companies. They, yeah, there was technology involved in how they developed and everything, but um, th they're not really technology companies in that they're working on techniques to develop different things. It, they're very different looking at Teledyne in its early days and stuff, which is a technology company or a Dow company, which is a technology company that, that um, uh, or Motorola, you know, that uh, Texas Instruments that Phil Fisher talks about and the companies we're talking about today as technology. But putting that aside, a true technology company in the sense of like, it's based on, you know, it's based on superior techniques, lower costs, um, uh, better performance, generally on something which has rapidly declining gross margins, where you make a lot of money when you're first to market, and then a few years later, it becomes commoditized, you know, and, and you move on. So, you know, a big screen TV maker or something today, or closer to something like semiconductors. Um, those things are generally not very durable. Retail is generally not very durable at all because those are unfortunately, I think they're operational advantages. I think they're production advantages. What I don't want to hear is like, we have a method to make this product uh, cheaper than others do. Because it could get competed away eventually? Not just it could, it will. Yeah. A, it will. And B, it'll erode internally too. Um, if you have an advantage, so one, if you have an advantage where you're making a lot of money off of that, it's going to erode internally as other people take more of the profit that you have, whether it's your deals with unions, whether it's whatever, there's going to be less of an incentive to be very, um, to be brutally cost uh, conscious. It's what happened with like CBS, or whatever. There's not a real good reason why CBS couldn't be as successful as Cap Cities. It just wasn't run that way because of who was running it and how they thought. Um, the other one is, the something like retail is really bad because the operational advantage that you have is the only difference from you versus someone else for the most part. I know people say the experience of shopping this place versus that place, but it it is primarily a method of get. It is not the experience of shopping in that place. It's primarily a method of getting access to the things that they want. So you're a middleman there um, to them. So because of that. And because the margins tend to be so low and the turns can be high, the only way to survive over time is through being very efficient. So on the one hand, that's good that the companies that you end up with are, tend to be very efficient. We've talked about with insurance and banking uh, and media, I think. I think there's very little incentive for that. So you do sometimes get one company that's way more efficient than another because it's self-imposed efficiency because a method to take a lot of market share is not through being more efficient. In retail, it is a method to take a lot of market shares to be extremely efficient. Um, now, insurance, it is a method in uh, car insurance, but that's like one of the most general forms of insurance that there is. So, but for instance, using the, uh, the media example, if ABC is more efficient than CBS is more efficient than NBC in the days where those were the only ones competing with each other, it makes no difference to what their market share will be. And actually they'll turn a profit. So they have to impose efficiency on themselves, right? Um, retail and stuff like that, the efficiency is mostly, po the best examples are retail and restaurants, the efficiency is usually imposed by outside. Because if you're not efficient enough, you won't turn a profit because the guy next door will um, uh, take your business basically, right? If you can offer the, much the same menu at $5 lower price, you'll be able to take business from them and it'll actually affect you that way. They can really hurt you. Yeah, and there's no IP either, right? You could go into any restaurant, you could see what they're charging, you could see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the advantages have to come from either maybe a brand, but efficiencies right. on the operator's level. Yes. Um, and you can compete on price things that way, right? Um, when we talk about the movie things, it's also an open book. There's zero secrets. Um, you can easily, in, I mean, they copy and analyze each other and do everything that way in every method. And there's a, a 
people circulating from one company to the next all the time that way. Uh, however, it's not an effective method to be able to offer the same product for a lower price and compete it away. In fact, the key thing there and something like that is there's very little you can do to hurt your competition, right? If I have, let's say, take video games. If I have, um, if you have Red Dead Redemption and I have World of Warcraft, let's say, there aren't exact substitutes, but fine. There are things people could spend a very long amount of time playing, right? Realistically, I can improve my product to make a lot more money on it, right? I could get a much bigger audience. I could do all this. What can I do to put you out of business? It's not easy. It's not easy at all. There's very little I can do to drive you out of being able to have a, uh, to being able to make money. It, in entertainment things, it's very difficult to push someone else out of the business. It, I mean, sometimes it's impossibly difficult. If they have a sufficiently good product, they will make money on it. And there's nothing I can do, no matter how big I am, to get them out of the business. Whereas Google, Microsoft, I can take, I mean, I could probably push out a, bit, a product that's superior to mine. You know, if so let's say I'm willing to offer Microsoft, I'm willing to offer my product for free. I can push anyone out if I'm willing to do that. I can bundle anything with it, but, you know, um, it doesn't matter how, how superior their product is. Whereas in other cases, a far inferior product is, it's hard to push out that way. And that's usually when I think of mode and uh, Buffett talked about it a little bit. I do think of it from the opposite perspective. In terms of making money off of a, a investment long-term in a company, the biggest issue from a rivalry perspective um, is usually how much can they hurt someone else? How much can your rivals hurt you? Not how much success can they have, not whether they'll get more market share, any of that. Uh, there's a lot of that. I, investors tend to think that way. Certainly business people do. Overly focus on competition in the sense of rankings. I'm in front of you, in front of that. You know, it, what matters as an investor is whether Schick will be a very popular um, and profitable product not whether it will ever outsell Gillette. It will not outsell Gillette. But the question is, what will Gillette, can Gillette do? And what will Gillette actually do as a rival that will hurt me, right? You know, if I'm Fruit of the Loom or I'm Haynes, I never have to pass the other company. I just have to be in a situation where I'm not going to be harmed in such a serious way that it imperils the investment. And usually we're talking about buying things on like a reasonable price to earnings basis when we're talking about it with value investors. So as long as you have a future in which you're pretty free from harm and you control your destiny to a significant extent, the, your, the company, um, then you just have to evaluate that the company is you know, sane, focused on the right capital allocation things. They, are, they, they have a good enough management. They have whatever. It becomes a lot easier because you're now just looking for problems on the inside. But when you're looking at companies and you're like, well, how much can AMD hurt? Intel can hurt. You know, if you get comfortable with the idea that they can't, um, it's a lot easier that they can't do a lot of damage. It's a lot easier to make the investment than in one in which you know that your competitors can do a huge amount of harm to you. I'm going to ask you a tougher question, maybe, okay. to piggyback off of your example with Microsoft. Why do you think Google Sheets didn't take off? I mean, if you think about the distribution that Google oh. has, the familiarity, I mean, everyone has a Gmail for the most part, and then there's Microsoft Excel. Is it just like a Microsoft Excel has been around for longer? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a few issues. I don't know enough about it, um, but in general, in what way has Google been successful in spreading within organizations? Um, I'm not sure that it's come out with products that it's ever really been able to do that very well. Um, so that's one issue of it. Um, the other issue, of course, is that you're used to using one thing instead of another that way, and then whether you get up to um, uh, whether you get up to scale, like you were talking about. And uh, then another one is obviously that most products fail. And certainly most of Google's products have failed. Um, I have a few that make a lot of money from them. And, and that's fine. If most of your products fail and the ones that succeed are a home run, then you don't, you know, then you've built a successful business that way. Most of Amazon's products have failed. Um, and that's not unusual. Most, you know, most of Procter Gamble's attempts to innovate in any way even in the most, you know, when we talk about things like chewing gum and toilet paper, most attempts to come up with another skew for chewing gum or toilet paper to be a success, they don't last that long. Um, they're, they're not really that successful. So, I mean, I think that is overemphasized usually, right? Everyone's, oh, Amazon is going to come in and destroy this business. So Amazon just fails in most everything that they try to go in and destroy the business. This is, they just fail for longer? Occasionally, they came with a phone. What did that do? The fire. I remember it. 
Right. Okay. You know, so I'm sure that they they have an effect on, on certain. They have a big effect on certain industries. So did eBay when it came out on on those industries. They have huge effects on price discovery and things like that. But just because they're going to focus on going into this industry doesn't mean that everyone should get worried about it. The market reacted with these dramatic swings in supermarket stocks and stuff when Amazon was buying Whole Foods, and it's nothing. I mean, nothing nothing's ever come out of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting though when you're talking about how Amazon has changed. Uh, certainly since like the dot-com era. And I'm currently reading a book, How Google Thinks. And at least when this book was written, which I think is probably, I don't know, close to over 10 years ago, okay. I think Google's staff was like 70% engineers and mm -hmm. how that's always been like a focus for them. So they continue to put out products or try new things or innovate. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's still 60 to 70% or what it is. I imagine as that company has grown, that has probably come down. Um, but yeah, I mean, good companies will hopefully continue to innovate. I mean, you look at the reflexivity thing of Amazon. They were able to build Amazon Web Services, and now that's a huge business line in itself. And that's interesting. So, so this is a good thing you brought up. This is a thing about organizations and how they um, adjust, right? So one thing to think about is how do engineers think usually? I mean, generally, what engineers go on a lot is the practical applications for high frequency data that they're getting or feedback that they're getting. So you go to market with a poor product, which you then iterate on all the time as you get feedback from everyone on it, making slight adjustments to improve it over that period of time, um, which is different than certain other industries and how they might handle things. Um, it probably affects things like, like Netflix. Netflix certainly thinks um more and and amazon thinks this way too to a certain extent um more in that kind of mindset when it comes to the things we talked about with movies and stuff uh than other organizations would they don't use the same way of rolling something out they don't use the same way of um uh testing something and seeing how to uh, testing it ahead of time um and that has resulted in some decisions that they make and what it looks like. And it's a result of the way that the company works. Um, there's often a big, hmm, there's a, there's, there's some tension in some companies in terms of if we want to call it engineering versus marketing. Um, the creating the product and selling the product. We're talking about movies things. There's a famous, um, uh, quote from someone on movies that said, um, all movie making can be divided up into two parts, um, the making of the picture and the selling of the picture, and they're equally important. So um, the idea being that, you know, that having the best product, for instance, doesn't mean that you're going to be more successful, um, that yeah, equally as important as selling of it. But selling of it doesn't mean that you're going to be more important uh, than the product that you come out with. So occasionally there are ones that surprise me with that i mean i uh i read um what's that strange book zero to one <laughs> yeah yeah zero to you. and so yeah and surprisingly in that one he does mention that you know that the marketing aspect of it is probably more important than the than the product which i would say you know it the, the selling of a product is the selling of something is generally more important than what it is uh from an economic perspective from a, lo a long-term perspective that way um there's a lot of great products that are made and and never sold and never catch on. Um, I, I wouldn't, you can't really sell a useless product, but you, you can sell um, inferior products and sell them better than others can that way. Yeah, you've said for a long time now how with talking to management teams, you would love to talk to marketing departments and see what they're doing and what their thoughts are and ask them a bunch of questions. Yeah, uh, and, and you're talking about um, Google and Google Sheets and stuff. They they did do a thing where they had tried to sell advertising a different way for a while, um, sell advertising for others. So they were going to buy up advertising or, or sell it on a commission basis or whatever um, for radio and TV and things like that. And then they would use what they have their um, the systems that they have to sell it um, to media buyers. And uh, I don't think that they were as successful in that. And one reason I know that they weren't as successful in that from hearing from people is uh, that, that there's no culture of um, customer service there. 
you know, that's a that's what the other thing is with the um, engineering things that we talked about. Um, there's a huge difference. All those companies that come up with those products are basically to achieve a huge scale, and then the customer will do everything for themselves. So you don't have to have any sort of support for it. The, all of their businesses are based on that. There won't be any support. Um, YouTube won't have any support for anything. You're good luck. You know, um, yeah, these things it. they'll they'll be uh, here back in a week. They might delete your things, ban your things, do whatever for reasons that are uh, right, wrong. You'll never know. Um, Apple things. No one knows how Apple Podcast works. Even the the companies that work with them to develop all the stuff that they use on it. Um, so that's different than say um than say selling some capital good thing where you have um after sales support for it and all that right so breeze eastern things an engineering thing but it's totally different because of the support that you uh, uh that, that you have with developing it in for someone else basically as part of a system when you're when you're designing it um it's that, that's i mean i feel like all of these things fall into that same category uh, lately, where all we talk about about great businesses fall into fall in much of the same sort of thing of of your Google, your Facebook, um, and and I don't know that that's the only way to have a moat or something. Remember, all the giant companies of today once were the Googles of their time period, not at the same speed that they got there, but they did get there um, to be a, a big size, and they had very high returns on capital in the early days. So there's other ways to have a moat besides just this very this way of going viral, getting up to huge scale, having no support and interaction with, with um, things and being very product based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Buffett's quote on uh, moats where he said, you give me a billion dollars and tell me to go into the chewing gum business and try to make a real dent in Wrigley's. I can't do it. That's why I think about businesses. I say to myself, give me a billion dollars and how much can I hurt the guy? Give me $10 billion and how much can I hurt Coca-Cola around the world? I can't do it. Those are good businesses, which is a very famous uh, quote of his when he's talking about Moat. And the way I think about it and the way that Jeff thinks about it is Moat is really about protecting a company's profits. And a business may make less profit because of lower sales, lower margin, or both. So we could talk about the two sides of Moat, uh, the sales side and the margin side. We've done a podcast talking about this before. We briefly hit on it uh, in today's podcast, but I just will go through the slides and maybe I'll upload these slides too. Um, so if you're watching us on YouTube, you could actually get access to this PowerPoint. Uh, but the sales side could be broken down into customer retention and customer acquisition. Uh, for customer retention, uh, customer behavior, Jeff had spoken about this. Uh, it could be subtle. Sometimes customers just don't think about switching. I like this one a lot. Price and sensitivity uh, it helps retain customers in the face of price competition. So we've spoken about before. I mean, if you're talking to management teams and you could ask them, what if your competitors drop their prices by 10%? What do you do? Um, you know, if they freak out, well, maybe that's a hint that their customers are pretty sensitive to price. Uh, customers may pay little attention to price when it's a tiny part of their total spending. I love that. Uh, I think, have you used this to describe a demon dust business or pixie yes. dust business? Yeah, yeah, pixie dust and demon dust. So pixie dust is the one that many people are more familiar with. This is you sprinkle a little of it on uh, uh, the product onto a more expensive product McCormick. and it gives you a great result. McCormick. So spices are a better business than uh, generally the product economics of, of spices are more attractive um, than protein, right? So you'd rather be the uh, chicken rub seller than the chicken seller. Uh, because people care about the price per pound of chicken, they don't have any idea what the price per pound of the spices they are uh, are. They don't know how long it lasts. They don't yeah. know any of the stuff. <laughs> you know, you you want to be selling mustard and sauces and 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 um, condiments and things like that. You don't want to be selling um, bacon, right? Yeah. Um, as much. Now, there's all sorts of other things that may make it more attractive or not, but that's a good example. However, there is a better sort of position to be in than a pixie dust business because pixie dust business all it does is it makes whatever you have better and that's the demon dust business the best business to be in usually is one in which it's a small cost of the overall project or the you know the total spend there and it could mess everything up that's where you can command the most money um that is a large part of when we were talking about the the movie things 
of technicians involved in that stuff, why can they get paid a lot of money, right? Um, you know, like, for instance, some, some people, uh, if we add up like per day things and stuff, are paid more money for a few weeks of writing work on a movie uh, in the moments before it's about to start shooting than someone gets to uh, sell a script for the entire movie uh, when it's not known if they're going to make the movie or not. Why? Because it's happening in the second case and it could mess up everything. And so even if you paid someone a million dollars, um, if, if this is a hundred some million dollar project, this is worth it. This is insurance on this now that's happening. But in the early stages, it's not so important to pay a lot of money for something. It's not necessarily going to happen. We haven't put a lot at risk here. Uh, it's much more difficult to get something um, to get a lot of money from that. And so the demon dust one is definitely like, um, so product that fails and it shuts down your whole assembly line for it. Uh, product that fails. And so your your one company gets a technician out slower to your elevator and you uh, own an office, you, you manage an office building or an apartment building or whatever. Um, you're going to go with the one that you trust. So a lot of times trust things are a much bigger bit, uh, advantage with the the demon dust business thing. And uh, Charlie Munger's given an example of it, which is like literally sometimes even charging more for the product helps signal that it is better and people will buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go on Amazon and you look up something and you know that this is something that you're going to do that um, if it fails will be a problem. You know, you're connecting all your, your uh, technology things together and whatever. And for some reason, let's say it wasn't like a, um, USB thing that's going to work or it's not going to work, but it's some radio thing, some analog thing, whatever. You think it's going to affect things. Um, you actually might be biased not to buy the $3 uh, cord, the $3 wire, um, because you're putting into a system that's thousands of dollars and you care about the quality of the sound or whatever. You might be more likely to buy the one that's twice as much, even knowing nothing else about it and you've never bought this part before. That's how strong the demon dust thing is because you say to yourself, I'm not going to buy the you know, it's regret minimization, right? Yeah, I'm not uh, going to buy the thing that's the worst that it could have. You know, um, one time I saw there was a toaster that was for like $4 or something. Someone's like, oh, this is great. The, the, the best thing that can come out of that is it makes toast that's the same quality as toasters that cost normal amounts of money. The worst thing is like it catches on fire and burns. And stuff. It's yeah. probably not the best <laughs> thing to try to save a little money on, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, everyone's going to want the $20 toaster instead of the $200 toaster. But do you really want to have something that uh, heats up and it's an electrical thing that costs $4? I don't yeah. know. Some people are going to say, I don't want that. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, the, you know, that's more the um, thing. And especially if it's in situations like that, where say you don't even care as much and you're going to be uh, about good outcomes, but you're going to be in a lot of trouble if there's a bad outcome, you know? So I think we mentioned Encore wire one time because the price of copper went up a lot in that, you know, drove a lot of profit for them and everything. But wiring is a good example because their wiring stuff often goes into building projects and um, there's total insensitivity to price on um, building projects generally because there's not an easy substitute. You, I mean, there are ways if everyone decided to design how we build things differently that you could use less of one thing instead of another. But generally on the project, there, there isn't a lot of um, possibility to switch things. So either the project's happening or it's not. What there is a huge amount of sensitivity to is um, order fill, delivery. So if it's delivered on the wrong day, I either have something on site I don't want right now that I have to have for a while, or I don't have what I need. And now X, Y, and Z can't be done because that can't be done until this uh, material is on site, right? So... Or someone just tells me, you know, as can happen sometimes with Amazon or something, which for a consumer thing isn't as big a deal, is, oh, I'm sorry, your or something's happened, your order's been canceled. We told you it was happening, but now it's not happening. You can't do that for a building thing, right? You mm -hmm. need to have total reliability on that side of it. So the, the, the thing there is like, and that's the Buffett thing about people getting fired for going with, uh, no one gets fired for going with IBM or whatever. The issue is no one will remember if everything goes well. They won't really, no one will ever remember that you paid 2% um, more for the copper that was used in the project. But they will remember forever that this company didn't deliver, right? Yeah. 
So yeah, price is an advantage if you both can have a 99 point whatever percent fill rate and stuff. But if one of you is 90 and the other was 99, then there, it doesn't matter what the price is. Yeah, you know? sure. So, and as investors, we want the ones, we obviously are looking for the things with pricing power. So we look for the ones where there's an advantage that isn't pricing usually, right? Being the lowest cost uh, one is usually what we don't look for. So we look for things like the deep dust one. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was in a, I went to get a drink in a gas station and um, the iced tea brand, I forget the name of the brand right now, but it's the one that's like always been 99 cents. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, I'm like, I feel like this has been 99 cents for as long as I can remember, even when I started drinking these in like middle school. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, you know, does the company actually have pricing power? Would they ever be able to raise their prices? I mean, they're probably just getting smoked through this current inflation that we're having in the market right now because their main product is we sell for 99 cents. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, Dollar Tree's obviously changed some things now. We talk about it sometimes with online things. I don't know if they have a lot of pricing um, power, you know, the Netflix and companies like that, because it, it depends on the customer acquisition. Arizona, cost, right? Arizona. ICT. Okay. Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the customer acquisition cost because if you raise your price too much, and your customer acquisition cost is too high, then you've got a problem because your churn becomes a huge issue. Um, if you're if you don't have high customer acquisition cost, then it's not as big an issue if you have some churn. But what companies can do, right, like Netflix in that example, is explore other things like advertising, other re revenues, other areas towards monetization, which sometimes are different ways that you can do things to get a different reaction than just pure price increases. We talk about food things; usually, it's shrink the um, the amount that you're getting. So the package that used to have eight things has seven, and that's a, a way to carry on a price increase or that combined with some price thing can carry out the increase in inflation, right? Because while there is price insensitivity, if you double the price on any of these things in one go, you're gonna get some cancellation. You're gonna get some negative, uh, you know, it, everyone should look at the annual report, the uh, whatever annual letter it was that Buffett goes through, sees candies price increases per pound, because he's the one we know who decided that. He did not leave that up to the CEO. He made that decision himself to price it because uh, he would be worried the CEO wouldn't price it high enough. So you can see how he did it in the high inflation 70s and 80s and how he used it maybe into how you try to do a price increase in a way that is uh, that works when you have pricing power, but isn't too much. Mm -hmm. And then we have switching costs. Uh, customers must bear costs when they switch from one product to another. The magnitude of switching costs determines the degree to which a customer is locked in. I think this is kind of an overused term. Um, we talk about like banks, insurance companies, stuff like that. Oh, they have high switching costs. I mean, not really. It's easy to um, you know right. move from bank to bank, from broker to broker. The way I typically try to think about switching costs, Jeff, is like if almost whatever you're switching from is the foundation of something bigger. And what I right. mean by that is like if you have a core processor and you've been using the core processor for a very long time and maybe you want to switch to a new core processor like your banking you know, and want to switch to that well that's going to require you know a big uh, move whether that's you know financially you're gonna to have to invest money to do it you don't want your current systems to go down it's just a huge pain in the ass and <laughs> quite frankly to do it that's the way i typically think about it, almost from like a inertia standpoint which i guess you could right. loop in with customer behavior but i try to think about that also with switching costs I don't put like yeah. a dollar value on it. Sometimes. Right. That's, I think the problem is that we're thinking about costs and economists are using the term differently when they talk about cost, but we're talking about cost in, in, uh, often we think very quantitatively money, uh, in terms of thinking about a dollar value. Um, a really big thing is kind of what you said. It's the number of connections of all the little things that are connected that messes everything up. The worst would be if it does something to mess up your workflow, right? So anything, you know, we're talking about Google Sheets or whatever, it, who knows, but if it in any way messed up the workflow that people are using it, that it's at all different, it's going to drive them crazy. A word processing thing, whether it's uh, Microsoft or Apple, who cares, what does it matter? You could learn either one. But if you've been, uh, or a keyboard, you know, yeah. uh, a QWERTY is not necessarily the best way to lay out a keyboard, but no one's going to switch from one to the other, even though there would be a benefit and presumably no cost. It's not really a big cost. I mean, you could train yourself on it. Um, but once you're trained on one keyboard, you're not going to switch to the other. So I do think that, like we said, it's the inertia thing of having to overcome it. Um, and also there is something else happening here, which is hard to explain, but 
it gets into a deeper psychological thing. So maybe we should talk about it a little bit. Um, in general, people underestimate how great a business is something that visibly and immediately benefits you. Uh, the, the benefit is immediate and visible. Um, and the, the trade-off is long-term and less visible, right? Uh, free Gmail, no privacy. Privacy is not visible at all, so that's a good thing to have. Um, uh, immediate benefit, smoke a cigarette, uh, causes no immediate harm, none. Only harm it causes, and it's probabilistic harm, is long-term, right? Yeah. Um, what you don't want is a gym, a diet thing, a whatever, which causes immediate pain that's very visible, and it's supposed to have some long-term payoff for you. Um, so that's, that's a big thing with the switching cost thing is anything that's going to cause you any friction, any immediate pain, any, any um, you know, they talk about when design these things as pain points and all that, but um, any of that that slows it down is going to be a problem. And anything that gives you an immediate hit of something is going to be a benefit, even if it has very bad long-term consequences, if those consequences are either probabilistic, like you said, or um, they're way off into the future. So you do want things where you get the benefit now from it that way. The thing that's hard with the switching cost type thing is like, if you say, well, if you retrain, like, let's say getting away from consumers, let's say it's a business. The thing that's really hard to sell people on is, well, okay, if we shut everything down and retrain everybody for two weeks, the payoff of this is going to be much higher on an economic basis than that. Um, and we've proven this here and in this country doing this and this and what, it's still going to be an incredibly hard sell because it causes nothing but problems up front. The payoff is something that they can say the payback period is X, Y, Z in the, in the future uh, down the road. But it's just a really, really hard sell. And, you know, there's lots of things like that that are the same sort of things in terms of psychology of how the, the sale works. Um, you know, the, the Coke thing, a huge part of it, when we talk about that, is um, the total availability, which is one of the most important things. Um, the, that's hard to overemphasize how important that is to people having total availability of a product. So like I could have the product here in the United States and I could fly to Italy tomorrow and still have the same Coca-Cola. Is that what you're saying? Right. right. Uh, a huge thing is if you, so Coke doesn't have to be your favorite beverage. Most people I would assume who drink way more Coke than they drink other products uh, prefer some other products to Coke, right? But if they walk into any restaurant, any movie theater, any stadium, or on any airline, and they say that they would like a Coke, they're either going to be told, okay, here it is, or uh, we have Pepsi. Oh my That's all gosh, that's going to That is the worst answer ever. There's right? no bigger downer than hearing that. that, that but what they will not say is, we, oh, we do not have cola. Right? They're not going to say that. Um, however, if you want this uh, um, uh, certain other products that you might have, right? Um, you, you just won't be able to have it everywhere. And this you know, sounds like such a small thing. I'll, I'll give you another example because it's, it's statistically proven and stuff. Um, one reason why subprime lending works the way that it does is not that people uh, can't get a loan some way else. Uh, uh, so sometimes it is that people seek out a situation in which they know they will be approved for a loan. Now, this makes very little sense. It, uh, being rejected for a loan can have some slight effect on, cr on uh, credit reporting and uh, credit scoring and stuff like that. It, it makes very little you should shop around. Every economic theory would tell you you should shop around. Not only should you shop around, it would be like if you were suggesting what colleges you should go to, you should have a variety of things where you say, okay, if, I aren't, if I'm not rejected at one of them, then I didn't uh, apply to ones that were good enough. Otherwise, how would I know? You know, you should, you, getting, 
applying to three schools, knowing that you'll get into every one and being accepted, it should not be the goal, right? That's what people will tell you you shouldn't be doing and seeking out. But actually, there is a factor in, in loans uh, that people uh, do not want to be rejected. They want to be sure of acceptance. And that's true in a bunch of different other um, environments where the same thing happens. The certainty that they will, that this will uh, work out is very important to them. Um, and so situations in which, you know, um, that, that, and that is part of the reason why things like, you know, obviously we get too much inventory at some retailers and stuff is because retailers are very aware of what happens when they don't have stock on hand and someone needs an exact thing, they don't have it and how dangerous that is to the relationship. Um, but that, that's one that's like psychologically, I don't know that people think about enough. I, in most things that I read, for instance, about lending things, no one mentions the fact that um, being almost sure, if you walk into a car lot, that's a subprime thing, being almost sure that we can get you in some car with some loan, offer you something. Um, when I did research on Progressive, the thing that stood out that the independent agents, um, so Progressive has a direct business, but then they also sell their agents. The thing that the agents stressed beyond anything, they stressed some things that you would expect that they have some support from Progressive, that the technology and that they they use um, is good to work with or whatever. But what they really stressed is Progressive will give me a quote when I have a prospect. When I have someone there, they will provide a quote and people have heard of Progressive. And that's what people need when, for, for the agent to sell car insurance, to sell insurance. What they really need is I need something that I'm sure will give me a quote to make the sale. And I need something that I know that um, they've heard of, because that's a problem to get over if I, I say that it's um, Amigo insurance or whatever, and you have no idea what that means. Um, you know, those are the two things. And so that's kind of what I was saying about the rejecting or whatever. They want to be sure that they can make a sale. And having a system in which people are afraid to go onto some uh, car lots because they don't know if they'll get approved for a loan or not, versus ones in which they do know it, even though they might end up in a car they don't want to have, an interest rate they don't want, terms they don't want, whatever, but that they will walk away from it being accepted with a car is actually a bigger factor in those cases than, than the pure differences in, in rates and things that the uh, write-ups will always talk about. I wonder if the fact that what most people get loans for is kind of like an auction system, right? You don't want somebody to come and steal the product or buy it before you, buy the car, buy the house. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if that also adds to like that psychological feeling of i need something now yeah well we talked about segment and people buy um for for advertising things and stuff like you know stuff like that um obviously the very valuable uh information in terms of targeting for someone for an ad the most value you could have is someone just open up their phone to look for something about cars and they're on a car lot and i can tell that they're they're at a car lot when they're doing it mm -hmm. because this is now a prospect that you'll pay hundreds of dollars and stuff to have um whereas someone doing that at home you know they haven't they haven't locked themselves into that at all when someone's at home they're browsing zillow once a while or whatever they might not really be serious about buying a house uh but when they're putting a bid on some house then they are and then obviously it changes things and then there's all the commitment um to that and and um the not wanting to uh think that you're going to get something and then not get it and all of those things, which has to do with the search stuff that we talked about. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand what point someone's in, in terms of the search, uh, like prospects in, in terms of the search um, mode, how far along they are in it, what they've narrowed it down to, whether they really committed to doing something or not. Um, once they're really committed to making a purchase, um, that they're going to go through with this, uh, is very different than trying to uh approach them at other times uh and so the thing with with moats and stuff usually is keeping them in a state in which they're not really seriously thinking about you know making a switch got it so customer acquisition and i'm going to run through these because sure. i think we're over two hours now uh distribution as we spoke about big food companies by owning key brands they have the power to convince retailers to carry new brands and then we used the example of journal publishers like john wiley jeff has spoken a lot about that uh, Mindshare, we spoke a lot about that today. Superior product, uh, which is 
usually the result of an investment in R&D or service. And uh, it's strongest when there's a network effect, which makes a popular product more valuable to customers. Um, and then price, right? Price is always a good customer acquisition tool as well, mm -hmm. or one that customers look for. Uh, so then there's this other side of the moat that I don't hear too many people speak about much, uh, which is margin protection. Uh, we did do a whole podcast on this probably a few months ago now. Uh, but margin can be protected by maintaining the gap between price and costs, right? Fundamentals, that's what it is. Uh, to analyze the margin side of a moat, the key questions are, does the company have lower costs than its competitors? Does the company have higher asset turnover than competitors? Does the company have higher customer willingness to pay than competitors? Is the power of suppliers and buyers low? Interesting for those first three. What company does that remind you of? Reminds me of Costco. Um, mm -hmm. Margin protection, low cost, high asset turnover, and high customers' willingness to pay provides a cushion against price competition in an industry. So another good example of a company like Costco. Um, and then Jeff talked a little bit about this earlier with the leaking out of the industry, uh, but low power of buyers and suppliers keeps profits from leaking out of an industry. Increasing concentration of buyers or suppliers is a big threat to future profits. Better organized buyers or suppliers may demand better pricing or they threaten to sell or source directly, which to really sum kind of that part up is Jeff's mental model number one. That was the title he used when he wrote about market power um, is market power, right? Market power is the ability to make demands on customers and suppliers free from the fear that those customers and suppliers can credibly threaten to end their relationship with you. And Jeff has written about a lot. We spoke about in the podcast a lot, how companies don't steal profits from other companies. They actually steal profits from their suppliers. And reading that book after Steve, when Tim Cook came in and the efficiencies that he implemented at Apple really nailed that point in, um, how much he squeezed their suppliers. And then, you know, they also raised the prices of, uh, mm -hmm the iPhones as well. So basically on both ends, I mean, just extreme market power is what Apple has. Um, but it was interesting to hear because you don't ever hear people talk about squeezing your suppliers a lot when you read write-ups right. and stuff like that. Yeah, and this is a really important concept because uh, I feel like people see market power when it is being exercised, investors, and so they realize it's there. Uh, but really what they realize is more that the company is using that market power. Whereas the, the valuable thing is, you know, what, what Buffett tries to do that way is to see through non-quantitative means, oh, they have market power and they're just not exercising it to the fullest potential. It wasn't, oh, C's Candies was raising its prices all the time so they can do this. It was, I think that they could raise the prices if they had to, that they could do these things. And, um, and we've talked about it lots of times, like I gave the example of Breeze Easter or something. One of the things that was shocking when we talked to people is basically the company wasn't keeping stuff in the inventory. To be able to spot them so like they were saying that my helicopter's grounded basically because i'm waiting on some part from them they weren't you know and eventually they made adjustments to that but if you hear that that's a shocking um example of market power because in most all industries if they say oh it's not available now wait six weeks you won't be able to sell the product um unless everyone in the industry agrees on that idea right that there's some whether it's tacitly or through collusion or whatever that they're able to get that possibility, um, usually you can't do that. And so you see really good examples of that. Uh, the, the advertising one the, is a very good example with the working capital thing. They very firm on the line that um, they don't provide financing to their customers, whereas everybody in lots of other industries does provide financing. So they keep the float. So, and that's a part of their business that they will have float. Um, most every other company in other industries doesn't exert that power. And so they, tend to offer terms in terms of payment terms that are fairly similar to other companies in the industry and what's accepted. So like you have 90 days, you have 30 days, you have 15 days, whatever, to pay this. Um, they don't say, look, we're not um, fronting you any money, uh, which is part of the thing about the advertising thing. It would be a totally different business if they didn't have it, but it's something that they can do, right? So it shows market power. And if you have market power in that one way, you probably have it in others. There are probably companies out there that could insist, and in fact, during the financial crisis or something like that will insist during COVID, for instance, probably would insist, okay, you're paying your bills faster now. They won't change the price on you and stuff, but you're going to now pay them faster. 
um, you're going to give us longer to pay you all that stuff, which is all just different forms of the same, the same market power at work. Yeah. Good point. So to evaluate a moat, we should look at three things, uh, barrier to entry, potential damage of new entrants and rivalry among existing firms, a uh, barrier to entry. This is where my mind immediately goes, uh, when I'm come across a new company, uh, it says we should try to detect all advantages of a company in customer retention, customer acquisition and margin protection. So we're bringing everything that we just went over and we're thinking about that uh, with its competitors, right? And different companies in the industry that you're looking at. A uh, barrier to entry is high when several factors are required at once so that entrants need not only money, but also time to compete as well. And two podcasts ago, Jeff was saying you want to compete in the industry where it's like, hey, scale may be a huge part of the industry and you're going to burn a ton of capital until you reach that point. Um, is a company going to do that? Is there some sort of survivable niche? All of those things are pretty uh, important when thinking about a uh, barrier to entry. The one thing related to that um, is the mega projects. So that's usually one where you can have huge advantages in sway because it's a big span of time. You need some experience and, um, uh, you can't get experience because you can't repeat the process, right? So the something that take something that's not just a big project, but it takes years to be able to come out with your first version of it, and then you can make only one of at first um, is is very different than certain other uh, businesses. So like um, jumbo jets are not really the same thing, or aircraft carrier submarines or whatever are not really just a different version of making a small plane that you can sell thousands of and make fast. Um, those kinds of projects. So, you know, they become like an engine, they become like an engineering firm. It's very hard to start up and compete um, by bidding for something to say, oh, well, yeah, we've never done a project, but you know, we're, we're offering less than these other people have been around for a hundred years. So you need some way to get the first bits of business. And so basically you time is a necessary factor. The, that's always great with industries because that's hard for people for new entrants. New entrants want to enter something where you can start like making money right away and stuff. No one wants to enter something where they say, "Oh, it's going to take years to build up this business." Potential damage from new entrants uh, refers to the threat new competitors pose to existing competitors in an industry. A profitable industry will attract more competitors looking to compete for those profits. That's the way that capitalism works. Uh, if barrier to entries are low, then this poses a threat to the firms already competing in that market. Uh, which is why, you know, Jeff, we we like settled industries. We like the industries that have gone through the crazy growth phase, throwing, mm -hmm. you know, bad money after bad money. Uh, the industry is more consolidated uh, because more competition without concurrent increase in consumer demand means less profit to go around. All this yep. is very basic, but I think it's good to to speak about it. Uh, I put together a list of uh, what I think is you know, poses a high threat of entry for new competitors to come into an industry. So profitability does not require times of scale. Products are undifferentiated. Brand names are not well known. Initial capital investment is low. Consumer switching costs are low. Accessing distribution channels is easy. Location is not an issue. Uh, technology is not an issue. Government policy is not an issue. You get the point uh, from looking at uh, the screen. Uh, rivalry among existing firms. Uh, this step is similar to barriers to entry. However, we compare a company's strengths in customer retention, customer acquisition, and margin with its competitors. Uh, we want to see some durable competitive advantages that allow a firm to gain market share over time. And we want to make sure that the moat is widened over time. So in conclusion, uh, when we speak about the difference between margin, when we speak about the difference between durability and moat, uh, easy way to think about it, durability. Will customers still value this product as much in five years or 15 years? A moat, will the company's competitive position versus its rivals be as strong in five years or 15 years? If you aren't sure about either of these statements over the next five years, you probably don't want to buy the stock. Um, if you aren't sure about either of these statements over the next five to 15 years, uh, you just need to seriously consider whether this is the kind of business you want to own and how cheaply you need the stock to be selling for. So again, understand what you're underwriting, understand what you're paying, and just know the situation that you're going into. And you always want to avoid 
um, you know, not thinking about this because risks to moat or durability that can manifest themselves within the next five years are typically what causes losses in a stock. Yep. That's all I got, Jeff. What do you think about that? That's great. And that can happen even, uh, the anticipation of that can happen even when there hasn't been a, uh, things that have showed up very much in the financial results, right? We've talked about things That's a good like point. Meta or, you know, years ago in the early, like around 2010 or so, Microsoft, where there was a perception that the business model was at a tremendous amount of risk because of changes in, in how people, uh, customer behavior in terms of societal behavior and stuff. Um, and there was just such a focus on that, that that even just the prob the serious probability of that happening had such a huge effect in taking in basically making value stocks out of things that still had very growth numbers. Mm -hmm. So like, then do you look at that situation like it's an opportunity or like at this point, I mean, because it is basically a value stock meta right today. Yeah, um, that's right. I should call it meta meta. Um, yeah, no, it, it is a value stock. Yeah. And there could be two factors, of course, involved with that which is um, that there's also cyclical factors. Since it's a 100% advertising focused company, there's gonna be cyclical factors that are not good right now for advertising focused companies. And then the fact um, that the, the threats to it, um, I think that, yeah, it is a value stock. Um, with Microsoft I actually wrote something back then um, and thought that it was a good buy. So uh, this, now this is, probably 50% more expensive than Microsoft, but it also was growing much, much faster than Microsoft was um, when it got down to a really cheap price. Um, usually when you have really strongly ingrained customer behavior over a long period of time, um, usually it's not, uh, it's usually a good thing to bet. Uh, how do I put this? Much more so than people think you should bet on the status quo much, much more so than you think you should bet on the status quo instead of betting on the, the, the big change thing. Um, and so maybe things that people in stocks like meta and all that have been kind of trained to bet on the, the trend thing, um, of what it seems to be the next big thing that way. But, uh, the, I've invested in a lot of different companies where, the only thing was just saying that it'll be the future will be much like the past mm -hmm. when there became a very strong sentiment that that wasn't going to be the case. And I think people over remember the times in which they thought something was going to stay a certain way and it turned out that it didn't. And so that haunts them forever, you know, of that company. Yeah. But sometimes the, the benefits can be really big when you invest in companies uh, where, where the future just is more similar to the past. Um, so, I mean, even we talked about Starbucks or whatever, what was it, maybe 10, no, not even 10 years ago now. Um, you know, their stock actually got, for Starbucks, a lot cheaper. Um, and that's, you know, once certain things start going negative, that becomes a really big uh, concern for the market, mm -hmm. right? So like, if we're with some of these companies, you see that all the time with restaurant things, as soon as, a, or retail things sometimes. But as soon as there's a concept which has only had positive same store sales for a while, once it goes negative, the stock drops like you wouldn't believe. Because, Instantly. Yeah. And um, and it's still with like increase. It could be with increasing earnings, with everything going better. Um, and with really growth stocks, of course, just slowing down causes part of it. Um, you know, it's interesting, Jeff, when I was speaking about like the overconfidence thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read an article the other day that TikTok is going to do like 12 billion in sales this year mm -hmm. and i mean look i mean that's we're looking at the screen right now snapchat their revenue was four billion so i don't know i i do think it's hard to project these things in the future especially more technological um viral type of businesses because i'm not saying meta is gonna go away or whatever but i mean TikTok basically came out of nowhere over the past couple of years and now they're presumably a larger company than snapchat so I don't know. I think it's tough. I really mm -hmm. do think it's tough. I mean, if you look at Meta's numbers right now on the screen, Meta was doing the amount of revenue that TikTok is doing uh, in 2014. And, you know, that wasn't even 10 years ago. So I don't know. I do think it's it's tough to get comfortable with um, like durability and the moat and whether the company will still be able to thrive in the future because look at TikTok. It came out of nowhere now. They're projected to do, assuming it's true, right? 
uh, twelve billion dollars in sales, and people are crazy addicted to it. Yeah, the question though is, if TikTok becomes bigger than everything that Meta owns, how much is Meta worth? Mm -hmm. It's not worth nothing. It could be worth what it trades at now. Um, I'm not sure that you need to be the biggest outlet for some. Uh, you don't actually. I'm sure that you don't. I'm sure that all the biggest ones will be fine that way. Um, in terms of what they could make, uh, we can look at the revenue and everything and think about what's advertising in, uh, you know, um, I mean, Meta is global and we can just see from the map that it's capturing actually a fairly small percentage of total ad spend in the United States. Um, total ad spend is a couple of percent of GDP, GDP is 20 trillion or something. You know, you can do the math and see that it, the possibility for making a lot more money is really, really high. Um, and it's high even if you're in second place, third place, fourth place. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that's a problem, but I also think that the, I think the winner takes all idea is more ingrained in people, uh, by the experience of some of the last few years and also by a focus on what stocks have done the best. And, um, as the way in which you make a lot of money in the 2010s. Um, and I think that that has been unhealthy in some cases in terms of people's thinking. We talked about this because we talk about movie things sometimes and stuff, but in the streaming thing, this is one that I don't get why there's an obsession with the idea that one streamer is going to be a lot bigger than the others. It does not make sense. I don't know what that's all about. And then this advertising thing, yeah, you know, but you know, I mean, when I gave the example of like uh, TV and, and radio and those things, sometimes in one network uh, uh, was um, not in first place in the United States for 20 years, still turned a profit. Um, I, I don't know what will happen, but if a certain amount of people use uh, Meta's businesses in certain ways for long enough each day, um, there'll be ways to monetize in terms of the advertising thing. The, the thing that worries me more for these businesses, is more of a threat for them, not that it's more uh, likely, but just more of a danger, I think is not the audience issues, but the uh, effectiveness of the advertising. So the much bigger issue is like, what if you can't use data because of privacy changes? Mm -hmm. What if you're cut off from that? What if you're cut off from, uh, I mean, that's huge. That's much bigger than losing a lot of audience. Uh, what if you can't, um, uh, what if it turns out that the pricing on your ad, on ads is more expensive than we think it should be and that companies have been over-investing in that and there's more of a shift towards offline things versus online, you know, what drove a lot of the growth in the early years was that the payoff of the advertising was very, for all these companies, you can see that because the growth levels are much higher than the, the audience growth. Uh, the ads were underpriced, that they were very effective. You know, uh, I think as investors, we might focus on the addictive nature of Meta's products from a consumer standpoint, but the consumers are not meta's customers they're the they're suppliers yeah they supply eyeballs the advertisers are the customers and what you need to have the right cost benefit is for the advertiser and so if there's something like you know data things for example targeting things whatever that can't you can't get around um that is a much bigger issue right um a much bigger because of the effectiveness of the advertising and, and there's lots of things about the effectiveness of the advertising that I've never understood about some of these companies. They don't explain that much about some of it. And so I don't understand some of it and how they're able and how it is as effective as it is in some cases. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Regulatory reasons, probably that they sometimes do things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, as I said, they don't, they don't want people to know. Some of them are probably violating certain things sometimes. Um, they're very big organizations. They might not even know everything they're violating in different ways. Um, so you do, you know, have that, uh, that issue, but I think, but of course they also have a very big hand in shaping. I mean, the, these companies are the biggest lobbying companies that there are of all. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have a big hand in shaping all of that. Uh, I, I think that the, the, when we think about it, the product price, the price, not the volume, you know, the volume of what they do is the audience, but the pricing, which is critical is the advertising and what it pays off for for the advertiser and so having it pay off is key that way and i don't know i'm not sure at all actually that 
advertising is as substitutable between platform as people platforms as people think. Just because your eyeballs are substitutable between TikTok and Facebook does not necessarily mean that the advertising is. It's not on Twitter. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, the effectiveness of advertising, for instance, on Facebook for local businesses has been very high in a way that it has not been for any other online platform. So for small businesses that um, uh, no small business that our owner has ever told me, oh, advertising on YouTube really works well. The, Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. So the ability to buy it in a certain way, like we're talking about with the podcasting thing, is an advantage for a really small company. And then the question of like how effective it is and why it's effective in certain situations and not in others. Um, and then there's other things which I think are there's I there's, you know we talk about movie things. There's advertise obviously advertising that stuff in a bunch of different uh, formats is as is more effective than would be on many of the platforms that that Meta has. Um, but on the other hand, I have no idea if uh, travel advertising on Instagram is the same as on uh, on other platforms. So we can talk about it. it. It wouldn't. Let's put it this way: it wouldn't be as good on Twitter, right? If we took some advertising to some location that we're trying to promote, it's not mm -hmm. going to work as well on Twitter. Does it work yeah. as well on TikTok or on one of these other things? Maybe, but I don't know if it's as substitutable. So you have a very low price on Meta. I mean, it's a very, very low price. So um, it's much, in fact, it's cheaper, significantly cheaper than, than more mature businesses that are almost certain not to grow at all in the same category. So businesses that are advertiser supported and probably will not grow in real terms at all. Some of them are more expensive than Meta is right now. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Uh, if you want to get access to the deck that I created for the podcast, I am going to upload uh, it to a Google Drive. I did the work to build it, so might as well make it timeless. Uh, so you could go to YouTube and you will see that in the description, uh, an uploaded folder or uploaded uh, documents. So you can get access to that. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our money management services, uh, we do run a fund and a separate managed accounts arm. Reach out to me at andrew at focusedcompounding.com. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and that like button wherever you are watching or listening to us right now. Hit that subscribe button on the podcast side of things. Thank you so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.